What's up guys? It's your boy Omni Sensei back with Reborn is the Anking in MHA. MHA X Solo Leveling. Part 4. If you enjoy my content, subscribe to the channel. Like the video, share, and leave a comment. Remember to check out the author of this fantastic fanfic. Link in the description. Also, I have set up a Patreon account, consider joining to support the channel. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. POV Bear. Truth be told, this isn't a spar. This is more of me helping Toga take a load off and get rid of some of her stress. That knife I gave her is basically a part of me. I asked the support department of this school if they could make a weapon good enough to cut into my exoskeleton. The power loader said that it would be quite bad for him to supply weapons to teenagers. Especially to those that aren't even part of his student body. He said that he only does so for the hero departments, and only if they are meant to improve the use of their quirks. Gadgets and other shit, I being an understanding and calm individual, didn't cuss him out and only left. Keeping my dignity untarnished. Okay, that last sentence was bullshit. We argued for a few hours, and I used my extensive vocabulary to tell him to go fuck himself in different ways in three languages, Japanese, English and French. I only know enough French to swear, BTW, I took a few steps back from Toga. This will more be a battle of skill since I'm restricting my strength to her level. This should at least get us on an even playing field. Well, technically, I am still a lot more skilled than her. I have quite a few years of experience. And she's basically a greenhorn in comparison. Although she does seem to have tenacity and reflexes. She is physically almost as strong as I was in my past life, as I've said before, so she's not weak. Well, she's just as fast, just a bit weaker in arm strength. I've seen many people much weaker than me. I've concluded that that level of strength is basically near the maximum one can achieve without any quirk relating to strength. The fight started on her go, which was pretty silent as she just rushed me. I was obviously prepared, though, it's kinda hard to take someone by surprise in a spar, at least in this manner. Her first move was to use the knife to swipe at me. I took a step backwards and prepared to kick her away, gender equality. But she was expecting that it seems, she reacted quickly and dodged underneath my leg, preparing to stab me on the side. She's quite a bit shorter than me, but I did aim for her head with that kick, so it isn't that surprising. I caught her hand, stopping her momentarily, then I kicked her away. This time, going for her torso, making the move impossible to dodge, as I also pulled her knife hand down, only letting go of it, when my kick sent her flying a few meters to the side. She took out a few more knives, where does she hold them? And threw them at me, I caught two of them and tilted my head to avoid one. If this is to be a fair fight, I can't just ignore her attacks completely. She used those knives as a distraction and rushed me once again, with a spring in her step as she jumped and basically prepared to take me down. Being in the air didn't give her much room for maneuvering, though. Which made me just grab her by the leg and throw her to the side. However, in that short exchange, she also managed to put a small cut on my arm. It barely reached my muscles, but it still left some blood on her blade. She managed to use the momentum of my throat to turn around in the air and land properly. Not taking much damage at all. Impressive. I have no reason to lie, maybe I underestimated her a bit more than I should've. But, it's hard not to, she's a 16 year old girl for fuck's sake. My wound still healed instantly, but her smile got large again as she licked off the blood from the blade. Careful not to cut yourself, I said as I threw one of the knives I had previously cut back towards her, I aimed it at her arm, but she managed to take a step to the side, barely avoiding it, as it only cut a bit of her uniform. I threw the other knife in the air and rushed her, I am usually an offensive fighter after all. I took a boxing stance. Sending a few quick jabs towards her as I was rushing in. She raised her arms too in a guard, but it was obviously sloppy. I could easily punch through it with a straight. These were just a few quick jabs though. She did manage to avoid some of them. Only two of them hit one on her guard, and one on her stomach. It made her gasp for air for a second. I used that opening to send a right hook behind her guard. It hit her on the side of the head as she was sent tumbling towards the ground again. She also raised her knife as she was falling, managing to get a small cut on my shoulder. Overall, we are mostly trading wounds, although she'd have a lot fewer chances if I fought more aggressively. She rolled on her back and looked at me with excitement. Did she think I wasn't going to injure her or something? She does look surprised, not in a bad way though. I wouldn't give her any lasting injury obviously, but taking it too easy on her would be a bit disrespectful to do in a spar. Especially since I am the one that proposed it in the first place. Her smile got whiter and whiter throughout the fight, as it continued for around 30 more minutes. By the end of it, she managed to get quite a few cuts on me, but it was always just small opportunistic and shallow cuts. They were also healed instantly. But I was more referring to the zones that the injuries were made in. She wouldn't have been able to make any lasting damage even if I couldn't regenerate. While well, she was filled with bruises and she was resting on the ground. Her smile didn't leave her face, even as she was breathing heavily. You fought well, I said as I patted her head a bit. I also laid on the groan right beside H.E.R. out of politeness. She wrapped me in a hug again. This is quite weird since I thought she wouldn't have much strength left, but she seems energetic enough. She muttered a last tired thank you as she passed out. The knife I gave her still gripped into her hand. 
I just picked her up and started making my way towards the school's clinic. I am quite prepared for the verbal lashing that I will receive. It's kinda worth it not gonna lie, seeing her be that happy and not border neutral for once. I mean, she's been only down for the last two days, but still. Two days without any smiles is still not good. I mean, I obviously care about her quite a bit since I'm going through all of this shit. Well, not really in any romantic way she's still like 16 don't be weird, but she's nice. I don't mind taking care of her for now. It's not like I have anything else to do. I am quite bored anyway. I've also heard that Shigaraki is currently recovering mentally. Nezu said it will be a very long process. Although the little shit was annoying, he was quite harmless. Just another pawn in all for one's game. I don't harbor any hate for him. That's like I don't hate Kurogiri he's pretty chill. I did hate Giganto though. He was a bit more annoying too, and I didn't spend as much time with him as I did with the other two stooges. Kaidai is not even in question. The Kun had to die so I can relax properly. He was likely a bigger threat than all for one himself. With those thoughts in mind, I eventually reached the clinic. Where a covery granny started cursing at me for being a negligent idiot. And saying that I should be more gentle with women and other STUFF wasn't listening. I just let her ramble on, she eventually let me go. Toga did remain there for a few hours though. Just so her condition could be monitored. Apparently, some of the wounds I gave her were a bit much in some PLAC Esme, she's tough, she can handle it. Toga wasn't in any actual danger though. She just needed to regain some stamina so that recovery granny can use her quirk on her. Instead of heading for my dorm, I started walking towards Nezu's office. As I believe it's time to speak about my living arrangements. I can't really keep living here forever. The students come back to OMORROW I think, so I need to move out later today. Well, that depends on what Nezu has in mind. I don't carry the weight, POV bear. So I guess the time to speak about the situation has come said Nezu as he sipped from his tea. He doesn't seem all that pleased, so I know not to expect anything great. We've been exchanging a few P-L-E-A-S-A-N-T-R-I-E-S as is customary, but it quickly got boring, so we decided to jump straight into business. Should I take the frown as you're getting arrested frown? I said as I laid on the couch nearby. I wasn't really sitting upright, but that didn't seem to bother Nezu all that much. Although I could see the veins on Azawa's forehead twitch a bit. Ha. Huh. His fault he didn't take a seat quickly enough, now he's standing. Well this news can either be good or bad. It all depends on your reaction to them, and the choices you make from here. I can tell he's not exactly comfortable. So it will probably be annoying. Hit me I can handle just about everything, I said as I waved my hand a bit. Well. I have managed to secure an opportunity of sorts for you. As things stand right now, you have me and a few other people trying to sway the opinion of the people that want to incarcerate you, he said as he put his small CUP it's really small, like a shot glass, on the table. But none of us seem to have enough influence to actually speak out openly for you. We can at most lessen their drastic view on you. I just let him continue, as I can tell this is going to be quite a long explanation. But, I know a group that has enough power to protect you, and that might be interested in your strength. I think I know where this is going. I can negotiate some restrictions, like not allowing them to do any experiments on you or other things of that nature. I am very much against those. But I can't control their choices. He said as he looked down at the table. This guy is really stressing himself out for me. That's really nice of him. I don't think I've had anyone ever care so much about me, and I didn't even do much for him. I can already guess what my role would be if the group is interested in my strength. After all, this society looks really clean on the outside. There's bound to be a group that cleans up after the dregs, and hides the skeletons in the closet if you will. There's no way corruption doesn't exist in heroes, or that they are always there to save you. But this society has been led to believe that. And that means someone must be pulling the strings somewhere. The someone wasn't all for one that's for sure. Accepting his proposal will likely put me in yet another conspiracy written cesspool of power struggles and useless facades. But there's a difference now. I can be confident in myself. I am not the weak kid that got abducted by all for one after all. The name of that organization is the Hero Public Safety Commission, they are tasked with managing the interactions between heroes and society as a whole. Great, so heroes in this world are actually just puppets. I looked around the room for a bit, I think the heroes present can tell that I am aware of the implications of such an organization. Not one of them stared me straight in the eye. Tashinori was just staring at the ground a bit, gritting his teeth. But I can't really blame them. Hero, it may have a glamorous title, but it's just another job after all. Doesn't matter how much they are idolized by the public, they simply aren't real. I would laugh, but this isn't even fun to hear. It's very similar to how Hollywood worked back in my world. Guess that the heroes are actually also fighting evil. I guess not all the bullshit all for one was feeding Shigaraki was fake. This hero society is quite fucked in the head. The amount of manipulation is quite sickening. It's almost as if the public is being spoon-fed happy juices of great news, while serious things happen to the more unfortunate folk. I have yet to contact them, but I am quite sure they will accept. Only if you wish so I am afraid I can't do much of anything besides that. He took a long sigh and looked back at me. I am already like a fish swimming upstream, if I attract even more attention to myself hiding you here will become impossible too. Hmm, now. I guess it's time for my response. Well, I think he has one last thing to add. I think you would also be forced to become a hero, at least an underground one. 
so that any previous charge can be erased. That's another problem. All Might has already asked me if I wanted to be a hero, I obviously responded with hell no. I simply would find running around and saving people all day bothersome. He was a bit disappointed. But he didn't press the issue. That must mean that he was asking for Nezu as well. The principal probably wanted to know my stance on the profession, so he can know how to invite me into it. Well, if he's sticking so much on this, and I doubt I have many other options. I can always become a fugitive. But that's more annoying than anything. I'm sick and tired of having to avoid law enforcement. I left the gang life to become a normal bloke, my circumstances force me into a life of crime here, but I don't want to continue it. There's nothing to see in it. The underworld is just as boring as the regular one. Just a clash of egos on a D-I-F-F-E-R-E-N-T less legal stage. But, I am not becoming anyone's delivery boy all over again. So, I will negotiate for myself. The only way I know how of course. I don't care what title is put on my back. But I want to handle the negotiations with this committee myself. I said, the people in the room looked a bit surprised by my decisiveness. But Nezu looked a bit concerned at the last part. Um I'm not sure if that's a good idea, I am afraid I can't let him finish that. I don't want to let him sweet talk me out of my decision. No either that or I flee the country, I said as I looked at them. Nezu didn't seem to know what to do. How about this you arrange the meeting I promise you that no one will be in danger, and I promise you that I will accept their proposal, Nezu just looked at me for a bit. Unsure, but, in the end, he decided to put his trust in me. I guess you won't budge huh? He said as he rubbed the bridge of his small nose. The other teachers in the room were also listening intently. Very well please, be careful. Negotiations can be extremely delicate at times. Shit, this guy is probably my biggest bro at the moment. I don't even want to think about how many loops he'll have to jump through in order to get this arranged. But I know that I owe him one. Well then who wants to go for a drink we can get to work tomorrow, I said. I will do my best to de-stress them a bit. I know just the place too. You're still a minor though said midnight, damn bitch always teases me with that. She's still hot though, I'm grown in the right places, but we can speak about that later, after drinking a bit, of course, I said all of that in quick succession, not letting any of them respond to that first part. Midnight did raise an eyebrow though. Where would we even go? You're a wanted man. Asked Tashi while holding his head. Don't worry my good friend. I said as I appeared beside him and put my hand on his shoulder. I know just the place. I said with a cheerful tone. Tashi did look beyond weirded out though. You guys might want to wear something less heroic. I said with a finger in my mandibles. I could see some of them sweating at this. Nezu just sighed. A bit of rest might be helpful, we have a lot on our hands afterwards. I can certainly use a drink said Snipe while twirling his gun. I would prefer some sleep, but I guess it can't be that bad Azawa is also in on it. The rest weren't all this expectant though. In the end, only Mick, Snipe, Azawa, Tashinori, Midnight and Nezu agreed to my invitation. The heroes went to change, the rest just left the meeting. Leaving me only with Nezu and Tashi. I could hear the two of them whisper to each other. I honestly don't think this is a good idea said Tashi. Sumei am a curious individual, though Nezu responded with excitement. Leafing Tashi a bit flabbergasted. Ha, they don't even know what this night has in store for them. POV narration the heroes that had accepted Barry's proposal, didn't really know what to think of it. Midnight just found Barry too fun to turn down, as Alwa just wanted to make sure nothing bad was going to happen. Present Mick was really just B-O-R-E-D and he didn't want to be left out, while Snipe genuinely wanted to get something to drink. The four of them went to change, the only one that had some distrust in his mind was Azawa. Still confused as to where exactly Bear was planning on taking a group of heroes. His conversations with Bear were few and far between, but the two of them had quite a few things in common. Like a hatred towards the press. They had somewhat bonded over the unfortunate accident that the reporter found in the trash can had suffered. As always still considered Bear's actions immoral, but he also appreciated the decisiveness in them. He had no gram of hesitation when it came to doing something meaningful. Just like he had accepted Nezu's proposal almost instantly, sure, he had made his own terms, but it was a lot better than the response Nezu was expecting. All the teachers were gathered there to try and pacify him, just in case he got violent. It was unlikely, but his upbringing made Nezu consider that possibility. They had no delusion of actually being able to fight the Insectoid. He was far stronger than anyone in the room, without proper planning, even if they ganged up on him, they would never achieve anything. But that wasn't really all that important, everyone in the room also appreciated his quick attempt as lessening the atmosphere. There was a lot to do, but insisting on a day of relaxation for all of them was appreciated. The heroes didn't take long to get dressed in casual clothing. Namuri being the last one to F.I. and I.S.H. makeup and shit. She reunited with the group outside of Nezu's office, they all looked at Bear expectantly. So, where are we going? She asked as she approached the confident Ant-Man. Little did she know Bear was not thinking two steps ahead of himself. POV Bear. Ha, I have all of this planned out, totally. I just hope they won't outright want to go back that, my lady, you will have to find out. Just step and I said as I raised my hand and opened a misty portal to a special location. Ooh I like surprises. She responded with a bit of a grin and a somewhat seductive tone. I fucking love this gal. I bet you she's the type that's openly promiscuous but doesn't actually put out in private. This already looks shady said Azawa as he stared at the swirling misty portal. Didn't that villain also have this quirk? 
asked Nezu, a bit curious. All for one also gave a copy of it to me. This is the perfect cover-up, to be honest. Not like they can do anything to disprove it. I see so he was able to clone quirks. The principal continued to ask me questions. I guess I don't mind answering. Well, one of his subordinates figured how to copy the genetic composition of a quirk or something like that. He could endlessly copy any quirk all for one had in possession. This is also the only reason his Nomu plan was feasible. Even all for one wouldn't have enough quirks to supply an entire army of Nomus. Well, that's debatable, but whatever, the heroes slowly stepped into the portal, Bear entering right after them as he heard few gasps and a frustrated sigh. Where have you brought us? Asked Izawa as he looked at his pristine surroundings. The cramped alleyway was really not welcoming, maybe the spilled over trash cans, and the rats aren't really helpful, don't worry. This is a prestigious establishment I said as I boisterously pointed towards the sign in front of us. It simply wrote bar, it was glowing a bit, but it was constantly flickering. Um should I expect a fight? Asked Namiri, probably preparing to pull out a whip from her bag. Now everything's fine Nezu seemed to be the only one to find the situation amusing. Tashi didn't even seem to know what to say to this. Mick was just sweating a bit, and Snipe was scratching his head. Let's go inside, I said as I took a step towards the building. Nezu was the only one to follow me with a smile, even climbing up on my shoulder. I stopped for a second. What's wrong? Come on I said as I walked it open the door. They ended up reluctantly following in. I do technically have your boss with me, this has turned into a hostage situation. They also don't really know where they are, so I guess this is also a kidnapping. They either come in, or they wait outside. Hitching a ride back to Mucha Safa will take a few hours after all. Durani brought you business, I said, loudly announcing our arrival to the bartender and legitimate owner of this fine establishment. This does look a lot better on the inside, said Nezu from my shoulder. Jiren looked at me for a second, a bit startled, but then his eyes whitened when seeing the heroes. I ignored his reactions and just took a seat on my favorite stool. Well, I did have to throw someone away from it, but that doesn't matter. But he's a thug, he'll get over it. I regret this said Izawa as he stepped in. Gee, as if I couldn't tell by your expression. Wait, that's normal. Well then, guess I'll go fuck myself. Hey, it's not that bad. Been to worse places. Said Snipe as he took a seat beside me. Completely ignoring the strained atmosphere. I wonder if this place is safe for a frail woman such as myself, Amiri said as she walked in. She immediately caught the eyes of the villains inside. She's not exactly dressed like a nun after ALL is she ever. She's wearing a short skirt and a nice blouse paired with a pair of high heels. She's basically asking to get gawked at. But I don't get the whole frail woman part. This chick can likely fuck over all the villains in this place at once. And not in a fun way. If you have no item saying yeah, don't worry sweet cheeks I'll take care of you, I said in my best thuggish tone, as I patted my lap like a true gentleman. Or a vagabond same thing, pfft, sure. But you're paying my tab too she said coyly as she sat down beside Snap. The place to my side was taken by no other than Tashinori. He still looked speechless at the way things were going. He can't even drink, so I'll get him some soda or something. I'll have to ask Jire not to put cocaine in it, though ha I'm paying for everyone I extended the invitation, it's only natural, I said as I patted myself on the chest. Mick sat right beside Namiri, sighing to himself and looking around cautiously. Everyone was still nervous, but I think that's just because of me. The heroes are in civilian clothing, and some of them are even wearing disguises like F-A-C-M-A-S-K Azawa, and a stylish pair of S-U-N-G-L-A-S-S-E-S-N. The only person here that might be able to recognize them as heroes is Jiren. The more common street thugs won't recognize most heroes. Jiren stared into my eyes. He has somewhat regained his composure. I'm um, great to see you again I wasn't expecting something like this. Should I be concerned? He asked as he prepared to take out a few of my favorite drinks. He's just asking as a formality. He knows that if I wanted to sell him out I would have just done it. Now you're just my info broker anyway, you're a legal business owner with a good record, I said with confidence. He just half smiled as he heavily sweated. I can't believe I got roped into this, Tashi finally uttered his first words. Nezu snickered a bit, as he ordered some whiskey. Namuri chose some wine or champagne or something, Snack chose VODK in my man. Azawa boringly asked for some water. Are you guys seriously considering getting drunk in a place like this? He asked with a raised eyebrow. We are considering it, we're doing it. Said Mick as he patted his friend on the shoulder. Yeah, unwind a bit. Relaxing is good for you. Said Snipe with his glass already raised. MHM, don't be so stiff I don't think I need to mention who said this and with what tone, it's Namuri, and she's being flirty again. You guys are bad influence, as always said as he rested his head on the counter. Indeed. I must say, I wasn't expecting you to actually go through with this at first. But I can't say I hate it. Nezu said as he sipped whiskey from his shot glass. Well, what can I say? I'm full of surprises I said as I raised my cocktail of all the hard stuff that Jiren had in stock. Um were you sure that's safe to drink? Asked Tashi as he stared at the strange concoction that I raised to my mouth. Maybe. I said as I sipped from it anyway. Tashi just face palmed. I mean, what's it gonna do? Poison me. Ha. Huh. I wouldn't recommend anyone else drink it, said Jiren as he stared at the green yellowish substance in my pint. Nezu and Yumiri seemed to be quite amused by this. The night continued like that. Eventually, Tashi also relaxed as the people around us stopped paying so much attention to us. 
Making the Miri also eventually coerced Azawa into having at least a beer. Miracle workers, Snap drank a lot, but it seems his endurance is really good. He's only a bit tipsy, even though he pretty much matched me in volume. Nezu has been laughing and talking with Jiren and me most of the night. Eventually, Tashi also joined the conversation. I talked with everyone, I also hit on Amiri quite a lot. Honestly, I can tell she's not really all that interested. But it's fun, and as long as I'm not making her uncomfortable, I see no reason to stop. A thug eventually got the courage to approach Namiri, but Snap came in clutch and intimidated the shit out of him. This dude is brutal, putting a gun barrel in the guy's M-O-U-T-H-I, didn't even know he brought a gun with him, and staring at him intently. The thug pissed himself, it was fucking hilarious. Although, I kinda wanted to see how Namiri would respond to him. I wouldn't let it get out of hand though, she's a bit drunk. That's why Snipe intervened in the first place. In the end, I brought everyone back to UA, but I was left with the task of either teleporting the rest home or letting them on their own. I obviously chose the first option, Nezu remained at UA. Apparently, he usually sleeps there too. Weird, Snipe also lives in a dorm room, so he didn't need to teleport home. As always apartment wasn't that far, but he appreciated the ride. Tashi said that he had fun, but told me to be more careful with the people I usually meet up with. He's probably referring to my relationship with Jiren, and some of his LACKEYS one or two blokes joined us eventually, I reassured him and told him to just rest easy for now. He was, much like myself, not drunk at all. Mick just sang a bit and entered his house, half crawling and half walking to his door, waving backwards at me and Namiri. This guy probably won't come to work tomorrow. The last apartment was Namiri's. We've basically been flirting and exchanging joking compliments the entire night. We basically spent half the night laughing at some of the outfits people were wearing in the bar. Most of them just looked down in shame. Which made me feel a bit bad for them, but hey, they're villains. Her apartment is much grander than Azawa's. She's also a lot drunker. So I hauled her up the stairs too. I did make myself invisible to avoid cameras. I turned it off when reaching her door though, as there were no cameras in that hallway. She shakily got to her door and looked back at me. Say how about you come inside for a bit? She asked with a smile. This is somewhat unexpected POV bear. The night has been a lot of fun. But Namiri is clearly too drunk to think things thoroughly. As I've said, she wasn't all that interested in me, at least not in that way. I doubt she suddenly started liking me. All of these guys got carried away tonight. Namiri had a lot of fun with me, but I really doubt she will feel good about it in the morning. No, she'd most likely regret it. Basically, I had the choice of accepting Namiri's proposal, going for a one-night stand with a gal that's clearly drunk beyond cohesion. By doing that, I'd ruin any type of relationship I had with her previously, and ruin any trust she and the other teachers had in me. Well, maybe not to that great an extent, but I doubt they'd look at me in the same way. If this was me in the past I wouldn't even blink before accepting this proposal. But things have kind of changed now. I need to act more responsible I guess. There's also no way for me to justify this course of action if I were to take it. I also can't use the drunk excuse since Nezu, Azawa and Tashi were all awake and saw me being perfectly sober. So I will obviously, regretfully, refuse this invitation now that I think about it. There's also Toga, who's likely waiting for me at my dorm room, it's almost like she doesn't have one of her own. Hey why are you JST standing there? She managed to spit out an entire sentence. I put both my hands on her shoulders and just hold her. He should get some rest after all, it's already past midnight, a shitty joke, but just about anything can make this woman laugh at this point. She just cackled loudly as she opened her door. You loss. G night, she said as she stumbled her way inside -E, at least she managed to unlock it. But she forgot to even close the door. I closed it, locked it from the outside, and teleported the key inside, on the ground in front of the door. Kurajuri's cork is really useful, do I regret this already? A bit, I mean, she's pretty hot. But I'd probably regret it more if I did go inside. Oh well, back to my usual business. Taking them to Jiren was quite random, but I don't really know any other place that might accept me as a customer. Jiren will move his place after tonight. I mean, it would be weird if he didn't. But that's a good thing. I kind of want that to happen. After I join this organization I will want any criminal that I was on good terms with to flee the province. Well, there's only Jiren. And I think I've accomplished that. It wouldn't be that hard to find him anyway. In case I ever need him in the future. I'll just have to kindly ask some of his old regulars. I doubt he'd just leave and not inform them at all. Oh well, time to warp to my dorm. It's already kinda late, I kinda hope Toga is sleeping, to be honest. I let the purplish mist swallow me whole, and I reappeared in the middle of the dorm hallway. I opened the door slowly. I didn't even get a good look at the room after I entered, Toga was already jumping on me. She struggled a bit, but she actually managed to climb me and put the knife on my throat. The legs were locked around my torso, one of her hands was on my shoulder, while the other held the knife. She stared me straight in the eye. A playful, and somewhat angry look present on her face. I can tell she's not really gonna harm me, but it's still a bit scary. Hmm, maybe unnerving is the right word. Where were you? Oh shit. Maybe I should have told her about my outing. Um I was out with some friends, I said as I rubbed the back of my head. Completely ignoring the knife she has on my neck. And you didn't invite me. She asked with a smile, but I somehow think it's not genuine. 
Maybe the knife is giving it away. Who knows? Well, we went drinking. I figured you wouldn't be. And she didn't even let me finish. I could feel her legs hold tight on my exoskeleton. It doesn't matter. You should have at least told me about it. Understood now. She's getting a bit over herself. Toga, I can appreciate a joke. I can appreciate you caring about me. But I think you are overreacting a bit. My tone might have been a bit colder than I wanted it to. But hey, I am tired. I really don't feel up to it tonight. She looked a bit hurt. She jumped down from me, guiltily looked at the floor. I'm sorry at least she knows that she was a bit out of line there. I mean, I want to take care of her, but I don't like this obsession she so easily developed. God. This is why I don't date crazy chicks. I'm not even dating this one and she's already like this. Don't worry about it I'm not mad or anything we should probably go to sleep though I said as I picked her up and put her on my bed. She just turned a bit red while I just lay right beside her. Eventually, she was back in her usual position on my bed, which is with her legs wrapped around me and a hand resting on my chest. I took the joke a bit too far she whispered a bit. It's fine I also could have been calmer about it, we're both tired. Tomorrow is a big day after all I stared at the ceiling while speaking to her. She kept playing with my antennas, like repeatedly blowing them away. What's happening tomorrow? She asked in a confused tone. Did she forget that we will likely have to move tomorrow? The students come back I probably won't be able to walk around the campus as freely at least for tomorrow. Nezu will probably use the day to get in touch with that Hero Public Safety Commission. So I don't have to bother for long. Now that I think about it, I can always just walk around invisible. I see well, good night. She really is tired huh? I guess she was a bit concerned, she likely waited for me the entire time, with the lights off now that I think about it. And just like that, she drifted off to sleep and I also rested for a few hours. My rest was obviously filled with thoughts about ways to go about this predicament of mine. Before I join this organization, I will have to discuss a few things with them. I am sure my terms will be quite displeasing for them to hear. But I can be persuasive too. I can handle this, I don't like the idea of putting my fate in someone else's hands again. I mean, I don't care about receiving orders, but I like having some degree of autonomy and flexibility. Like I did when I was dealing with All for One. I like joking around about it, but the terms were quite lax when I was dealing with Shigaraki. He was also somewhat entertaining to watch at times. Overall, I've had worse business deals. Waiting around in that bar was not unpleasant to me. But, I don't really want a repeat of that, only this time without anyone to poke fun at. I can already guess the type of organization this is. I mean, it's not that hard to guess really, Nezu kind of laid it out for me in the meeting. It's a secret government organization with its own agenda. And those are always shady. Before I even realized it, it was already morning. Which means that it's time for me to wake Toga Yupi she's still snoring beside me. I can escape her clutches without waking her up, but that would be quite rude. I just retracted my claws and poked her cheek with my finger. I don't really want to cut her accidentally, I already got scolded for injuring her once. Five more minutes she muttered as she rolled around a bit and hugged the pillow. At least she released me from her clutches. I can just get up and get ready for my day, which consists of taking a shower and cleaning my mandibles. While I was doing that, Togo also lazily walked into the bathroom. I mean, I would be flustered, but I am always naked, so it doesn't matter. My schlung is also HIDD and inside my body kind of weird but convenient, so there's no reason to be shy about it. She splashed some water on her face at the sink, and proceeded to brush her teeth using my brush. That's unsanitary, I said while cleaning my antennas and claws. Huh. Oh, it's fine, I always use yours anyway. I'm okay. I guess I'll have to buy a new one and hide it. Or maybe I should pull a fast one on her and use hers instead. I like to take care of my dental health, used to do it at the bar too well, hidden, but I still did it. By the way, your phone was buzzing earlier. She said as she took my toothbrush out of her mouth. Nezu gave me a phone that he could use to contact me when I'm in the room. I don't have pockets, so he just gave me an old model and told me to keep it around the room. I'll pick it up later I stepped out of the shower, Toga scooted a bit to the side, and I stood beside her while taking her toothbrush and using it. No fair. I thought we were sharing one, she sounds a bit disappointed, but I don't want to do something like that. Maybe some other time, I said as I finished cleaning up my teeth quickly and went to call Nezu BACK he's the only one that has my number. I ruffled her hair as I left, undoing her bangs, as she stood there flabbergasted for a second or two. Then she angrily threw the toothbrush she was holding at my back. It just bounced on my back and landed on the floor. Shame, it was a perfectly good toothbrush. You jerk. She shouted as I closed the bathroom door. Clean that up later. I shouted back as I left. I reached the phone and called Nezu back. Our conversation was quite interesting though. Essentially, it all came down to completing our previous talk. Apparently, this guy didn't really sleep last night. He contacted the organization and set up a meeting for me. Apparently, it's this afternoon. I am to get ready and avoid getting seen by the students for now. I will be able to move freely after I manage to come to an agreement with the Public Safety Commission. They will handle clearing my name. Apparently, they are already planning a redemption arc for the public. Which is pretty dope. Although, I might have to take a break for today, so no walking around for me. I have to prepare myself for this job interview. POV Bear. The meeting place is actually just their HQ, which makes things a lot easier. Nezu kept insisting that I should let him come as well, but I kind of want to do those things myself. The building itself is quite large. It looks pretty safe, it's got agents surrounding it. 
I mean, the cameras also likely have some heat detection on them. So I can't really enter unnoticed, not that I need to. I was just told to make my way here without being followed. And, let's be honest here, there's not all that many people that could actually keep up with me. I still entered the building invisible, I even waved at some of the cameras. They probably expected me to come, so there was no alarm triggered. Now, I am currently wondering what methods I should use. I mean, I have a few options, some techniques I picked up in my few years of experience. But I don't plan on becoming a subordinate for them, this will at most be a partnership. A contract between equals. Problem is, they are highly unlikely to think that I am at the same level of authority as them. So, I will have to give them a little reminder of their mortality. I entered the meeting room, there were quite a few people gathered. Both heroes and agents. At the head of the table was a middle-aged looking WMA and she's not that old looking honestly. She shoulder linked hair slicked back and is currently wearing a nice dark suit. Overall, quite a classy lady. She does have that cold look in her eyes though, which kind of gives away that she's the leader of the organization. The people at the top of shady organizations always have the same cold look in their eyes. The LAD old boss also had it at times. I turned off my invisibility as I sat down in front of her. The people around us are likely for her protections. They all tense up when I arrived out of nowhere. But the woman didn't really seem surprised. Greetings I wasn't expecting such pleasant company, I said in a friendly tone. Her eyes widened a bit, then she smiled. Compliments are probably not something she was expecting to receive in this situation. It was also genuine. I was expecting yet another slob filled with arrogance and schemes. At least she's pleasing to the eye. Not that it will help this negotiation in any way. I was not expecting such a tone. It's great to have you. She said with that same smile plastered on her face. It's hard to tell whether it is fake or not. But I wouldn't bet on it being real. Still, the surprise in her tone is quite real. She likely expected me to just randomly start threatening her as soon as I opened the door, but that's not exactly a good way to start a negotiation. There's no need for hostility we aren't enemies, I said calmly. Well, someone in my position wouldn't expect such words from someone in yours. Even with Nizu vouching for you, I still prepared some reassurance, she said as she looked at the guard surrounding the table. They're probably just to give her some peace of mind, they should be somewhat aware of my strength. And I doubt they cooked up something strong enough to counter me overnight. Indeed it's understandable now, let us talk about the important part I sat as I rested my hands on the table. Her smile vanished, she gained a serious look as her eyes scanned mine. Indeed. As Nizza likely informed you, our organization can agree to shelter you and repair your reputation, granted you become part of it and join our system. Her terms are not that bad sounding, but she didn't specify what exactly I'd be doing in this organization, this is the same as not telling me anything at all. The words sound nice, but I'd appreciate something more specific before outright stating my terms, I need her to actually speak out on her own conditions. I can work around them from there. She probably expected me to question her like this, so she will definitely have a politically correct response. Well, your role within the organization would be more of a problem solver. But you will basically need to be present at most times in case something comes up. Hmm, just as expected. Take away the sugary words and the roundabout methods of talk. And what she said essentially comes down to you will do everything we tell you, and you will be under our supervision the entire time. And that isn't exactly a good business transaction now, is it? Even if she gets rid of my bad rep, I don't really like the idea of slavery with extra steps. I probably won't even have as much autonomy as I did with Shigaraki. All of my life will be under constant surveillance. I am afraid those terms are a bit unsatisfactory, I sat as I locked my fingers and rested my head on them. You see I didn't come here for this type of agreement I am here to propose a different type of deal something that might give you a bit of perspective her eyes turned even colder at my proposal. She probably expected me to act a bit more desperate but I am not exactly the type to panic in these situations. She didn't have any way of knowing that she probably just saw me as some hot-headed teenager. She made the first mistake right there. Underestimating the intelligence of your adversary is basically a great way to lose your credibility in front of them. And what might that deal be? If I understand the situation properly we are the ones doing you a favor. The frosty tone seemed to make some of the guards tense. I guess they really don't want a fight to break out. But it won't. If I started a fight here, that might harm Nezu more than it harms them. A favor is to be repaid, but in different means I have strength I have speed, I have a necessary set of skills, any problem you point me towards, I can solve, I said as I leaned forward a bit. My eyes locked with the woman as she seemed a bit surprised by my words. But the deal is one-sided you are overstepping your boundaries, my services should be more than enough, I said as I didn't break eye contact with the woman. You can't control me no matter what you do so, you might as well give up, it will only make you less of a necessity in my eyes, I said as I tilted my head. She raised an eyebrow, as a small smirk appeared on her face. Are you perhaps threatening me? She asked mockingly. Yes as I have stated I have a certain set of skills, don't become a problem I have to fix I came here looking for a business partner, not a new boss to take orders from all of the people around the table, seemed to become nervous when hearing me. I could even hear a few gulps. She seemed to ponder my words for a second, her mocking look from before had vanished completely. She likely won't take my threat as seriously as she should be. People in her position will always consider themselves invincible until proven otherwise. But, she should be smart enough to understand the implications of what I told her. Then what do you propose? 
Yes, just what I wanted to hear. POV narration The president of the Public Safety Commission was a smart woman. She liked to consider her options before acting. But she failed to prepare properly for this meeting. She had looked down on Bear, didn't think the child would even refuse her offer. She thought one of two things were going to happen, either he threatens them as soon as he enters the room, or he desperately accepts the situation and becomes their subordinate. She had prepared for both situations. But she was not prepared for his current self. He was compass, cold, calculated. His friendly front was nothing but a mask, cracking more with each and every word he spoke. His threat was thinly veiled, but it wasn't meant to intimidate. It was meant to send a message. And the president realized that. Barry technically told her there is nothing you can do, you either help or you don't, if you get in my way, you will die. She wasn't unaccustomed to threats. At first, she thought about refusing him, and just not getting in his way, to avoid any conflicts with him. But then she realized something else. Conflict with him would be unavoidable. She could only silently grit her teeth and become frustrated at that thought. He was by far, the most infamous and controversial villain of the year. The heroes were bound to clash with him. To obstruct him at any given opportunity. And she was basically their representation, she couldn't tell them not to fight against Bear, as that would make the public mad. So, Bear was forcing her hand. She now saw his sentence as you are either with me or against me. So, she was caught in a bit of a pinch. If she refused him, her life was at stake. If she accepted, she'd have to actually negotiate terms with him, or her life would be at stake again. She was locked in this situation. Only one choice left. Listening to him. She could foolishly disregard his threat. But she knew better than to do something so idiotic. The entire world saw him brutalize the previous strongest villain. She knew who all for one was, and she knew that Bear was more dangerous now. She needed to proceed with caution. My terms are simple I won't ask for the impossible, and I won't ask for anything overbearing, Bear said with a pleased tone. I propose a partnership I can help your organization where is needed, but I will only help with major issues. He started speaking of his conditions. The president didn't especially like what she was hearing, but they weren't as unreasonable as she expected. Bear was still giving her way out. I don't feel like doing menial tasks for you, I will also have to kindly refuse to live in your organization, his terms were not done yet, but the woman was expecting this already. However, I can accept reporting my location to you from time to time I can also accept having a group of your people living nearby, he was basically proposing that they keep minor surveillance near him. But not to the point where they would bother his day to day life. It was like extending an olive branch to the president. Allowing her a bit of leverage and giving her some ground to stand on. Giving her the right to at least monitor some of his moves. Bear made this move to sweeten the deal with the organization. He didn't actually care about being checked on from time to time. It was not 24-7 surveillance, and he kept his privacy intact. The president was thinking about his proposal. Overall, it was much better than she expected, but it was still not as favorable as she wanted. But, she knew that further arguing might even worsen the original deal. So, she was forced to just accept it. Very well I can accept that proposal cleaning your name might take a while though. She said as she finally sighed. She couldn't really hate or blame Bear for the way the negotiation went. Bear had acted with tact, it gave her no reason to actually hate him. But she still felt a bit used. She wasn't given many options, but at least her hand wasn't forced in signing something too horrible. And just like that, the two of them spoke a bit more. But the negotiation was over, they just got to know each other a bit better. They were finally learning her name, Oyama Risu, and she managed to learn more about his nature. They both left the meeting with a good feeling. She was happy at gaining a strong ally, even if it wasn't the way she wanted. And he was happy that his plan had worked. POV narration the day proceeded like normal, but Oyama's work had just started. After Bear warped away to an undisclosed location, she was left to wonder what methods she could use to clean Bear's name. She was certain that most of the people bandwagoning the hate directed towards Bear, were going to give up so easily. This is why she decided to tell Bear that clearing his name might take some time. She didn't actually know how long it would take herself. She just knew that it was possible. Yet, after looking a bit deeper into the issue, she found out that most of the public had a positive opinion of Bear. But there was a minority, most likely supported by the people trying to further vilify Bear, that kept trying to dirty his name further. This news was like having a load taken off her shoulders. She realized that all she had to do was snuff out the hate, by giving more publication to the positive things that Bear had done in the past. And, to her surprise, she had quite an extensive catalog. As most of the things he did consisted of hunting down certain villains or gangs. His portfolio was really in line with some of the underground heroes that the world knew about. Then, the course of action started becoming clear and clear in her mind, what if Bear was never a villain? What if he was just a spy? Recruited as an agent since YOUNG adoption scandal disappearance, trained and sent to infiltrate All for One's base of operations. All for One was, after all, the most powerful villain in Japan. And she was going to make sure everyone remembered that. She was going to publish some of All for One's past, to make people realize the type of threat that Bear was dealing with. Now, in this instance, Bear would technically be an unfortunate hero, a person that protected everyone from the shadows, even if the world hated him and resented him. If that information was to be leaked by a righteously angry co-worker the crew sick and tired of seeing his friend be treated as a villain well, she would not be able to punish such a righteous act now, would she? The people interested in him would be forced to back off. 
Then, with the truth come to light, his actual supporters will become more outspoken. And his reputation as a villain will be snuffed out, being replaced by that of a powerful underground hero. By doing so, she would also raise the reputation of the Hero Public Safety Commission, as they would have been the ones that contributed most in training Bear to take down All for One. But, Oyama was aware that this was nothing more than a temporary fix. This move was bound to cement Bear as a hero in the minds of the public. But the forces behind the scenes weren't going to buy into any of that. She might even receive pressure from all of them for pulling such a stunt. Therefore, she needed leverage. A bit of pull something that she could hold above their heads and threaten them with. Thankfully, Oyama had also just gained a powerful ally. She was certain that Bear wouldn't mind helping her clear his name. After that, she hoped that those people would just give up. They had little to gain from this point forward, but a lot to lose. For now, though, she was going to have to get to work. She would inform Bear about the proceedings after everything was put in place. It wasn't even going to take all that long. She didn't need to sway the public's opinion in his favor after all. POV Bear. What a long day. It was already evening when I left the meeting with Oyama. I worked myself on a random tall building to get some alone time. Oyama turned out to be a pretty chill person. A bit manipulative, but that's what you'd expect from someone in her position. Any interaction between us after the deal was made to strengthen any bond between us. It's kinda reminding me of my relation with the LAD old boss. We were both great actors after all. The guy might have acted as a friend sometimes, but he was a manipulative asshole at times too. Which is why I didn't trust him in any way. Oyama gives me the same vibe, but in female form. She's also a lot colder. I'd even call her opportunistic. She's a government official, so she would obviously have to be that way. Oh well, enough thinking about her. I'll have more time to judge her personality later. I don't think repairing my reputation is going to take over a week. But whatever, I've been hiding for a few years now. What's a week or two more? I wonder how Shigaraki's doing right now. I think he turned out to be related to All Might SOMEWHAT or something like that. Apparently, All For One was training him to flaunt him in front of All Might's face or something like that. Regardless, his mind turned out to be quite fucked up. When he woke up, he refused to believe that anything happened at all. All until he was showing some footage of my fight with All For One. He kind of remembered everything about our conversation. But the psychiatrist said that it would be difficult to ever restore his mind to a healthy state. Tashi was quite devastated when learning of it. And it seems that Shiki still holds the same disdain for everything that involves heroes. So he's not exactly willing to talk to any of them. Hmm, maybe I should visit him. Even if he hears shit about me becoming a hero he would never believe any of it. Oh well, I'll think about it later. I kinda wanna see how Toga is doing right now. Nezu said that he will try to transfer her into the general course, as she isn't exactly keen on becoming a hero. But she might become after learning that I also am technically one. Oh well, let's see what she's up to. I worked myself back to my room, she was just laying on the bed and playing on the phone Nezu gave me. What are you doing? I said as I looked at her. She was supposed to be transferred today, which means that she's supposed to have classes now. Present Mick didn't show up to school. I figured I'd spend my time here oh yeah I hope Nezu doesn't blame me for that. I mean, it's that guy's fault anyway. Why would he get so drunk on a workday? Both him and Midnight should be missing now that I think about it Snipe was also drunk, but that guy must have a good stomach for it because he was just a bit tipsy by the end of the night. Why always my room? I asked with a questioning tone. I sometimes think that Nezu didn't even give her a room. I mean, he always knows she's here. So he might have just done her a favor or something. How did the meeting go? She asked, perfectly ignoring my question while still pretending to be enraptured by whatever shitty mobile game she was playing. It went well could have been much worse, still a shady organization Toga just raised an eyebrow at that. Then why don't we just leave? It shouldn't be that difficult for you. She finally put her phone down and stared at me. Toga I'm tired of this crime filled life maybe it was exciting when I was younger, but the older I got the more boring it became, it has nothing to offer for someone like me, she looked a bit confused after hearing me say that. But that might just be because she doesn't know how old I am. My body may be 17 at most, but I am mentally in my early 40s late 30s, I've lived a life of crime for well over half of my lifespan. I know just how meaningless it becomes in the end money. I already have enough. Underworld influence and reputation. More insignificant than used toilet paper. The thrill of it. After each thrilling moment, you are only left with an empty feeling. Each dopamine rush gets shorter and shorter, your body and mind become accustomed to it, the excitement slowly dies down. It's impossible to live in a constant thrill, so you might as well not even waste your time pursuing it. Toga is likely scared of being around too many people. I think enrolling her in school might have been a bit too much too soon well, she's not scared of people. She should just fear their perception of her. This seems to be the problem for most people with a villainous quirk. Toga you don't have anything to fear you don't need people to accept you you are strong, you will manage, I am not great at comforting people. But I also don't want her to rely on me all that much. I will be here for her, but I don't wish to become her one and only pillar of support, but that might be needed. Yeah. She suddenly jumped up and hugged me. At least I will always have you. Exactly what I thought I would hear maybe it's better for her to have something to rely on at this stage so, I'll just pat her back. I will become her support. At least until she grows up to stand on her own two feet. POV. All might I am quite confused. It is hard to describe. 
Before meeting Bear, I felt guilty, ashamed that I had failed to save him. And even injured him. I thought that I wouldn't even be able to look him in the eyes when I met him. But I find this child, know this young man's presence to be extremely calming. Bear is always relaxed, regardless of the circumstance, he is always cheering the people around him, he had even managed to change the life of a young villain, a teen much like him. Yet another young girl that our society had vilified for no good reason. Nezu managed to get rid of the few crimes she had committed in her short career, and with Bear vouching and taking care of her, there was nothing to worry about. We knew that she's in safe hands. But a few things about her stand out, at least to me. She has this strange obsession with blood that many would find odd, even I found it slightly disturbing. Bear is just acting as if that is an everyday occurrence. He completely accepts her for who she is, and it's quite relaxing to watch. That wasn't the only instance of Bear doing his best to make things better for the people around him. There was also 13, that he shamelessly flirted WITH usually unreciprocated, and complimented all the time. It was a good way of raising her somewhat low self-esteem. As a hero, she had no confidence problems, but her personal life was a different issue altogether. Bear seemed to be aware of it too, even if his looks weren't considered quite desirable, it was still a good feeling to have someone notice you in that way. Bear hasn't even ever seen her outside of her suit, yet he always finds something about her to compliment. I have concluded that he knows a lot more about women than I do well, he has many quirks about him. And his strength is certainly one. Or rather, his ability to ignore any sense of superiority that his power might give him. He is always humble, always caring, but never too confident to be called arrogant. Even if he has all the right to be. It's quite obvious that he's a lot more mature than most people his age from everything I've said before at least at times. He has a strange sense of adult immaturity, he seems to be able to turn the most serious of situations into a joke, but also can act serious and compass when needed. After sparring with him twice, I reached the conclusion Bear is a monster. Not in a mean way, of course, I am merely referring to power and talent. He seems to never get tired, I can no longer match his stamina. Even the more powerful punches that I threw his way were shrugged off easily. Sure, I didn't go as far as last DIME I'm not even able to, but these same punches could, in the past, at least stagger him now, it's as if I was a normal human, trying to punch a steel wall. He also seemed to be quite talented in copying fighting styles. He sparred with snipe and seemed to match his shooting accuracy using a finger gun of all things. Bear has already informed us of how many quirks All for One has stuffed into him, so we knew what to expect. But this is to the point where I doubt All for One in his prime could match up to him. And he is still so young. It's only been a week that I've spent with him, but he's proven to be extremely great company. I am quite anxious about him dealing with negotiations by himself. But Nezu told me not to worry so much. And, I can see his point, Bear has proven to be an extremely charismatic individual. I wonder how it went, he came back at some point. But he's probably spending his time inside his room as to not attract too much attention. I am currently sitting in Nezu's office, as we are thinking of ways to announce his stay at UA to the world. Do you think people would respond positively? This is something that has been on my mind for a bit. Bear may be a great person, but even he has his flaws. The most recent one was that his fight with All for One caused many casualties. It's regrettable, but I can't hold it against Bear. I don't know how many chances we would have gotten to take All for One out otherwise. It seems Bear waited a lot to even gain that opportunity. Patience that wouldn't be expected from a teen but, I've yet to see him show much remorse for those killings. I've also not asked him about it why. Well, I fear his answers. Does he not see human life as something important? Did he pin all of the blame on All for One in his mind? Both were possibilities, I think some backlash will be present. I think it's better to wait and consult with the president of the Public Safety Commission about this Nezu seems to be quite certain of this. I know to trust his judgment after this many years. On another note should we talk about what happened yesterday. Going out drinking into what is clearly a den of villains was not something I thought I'd do with my Sunday night, but I did it anyway. And I even had fun. The unsavory sorts all seemed to avoid us like the plague when they saw Bear. Well, there was that one guy, but Snipe sorted him out a bit aggressively. There isn't much to talk about Bear wouldn't have brought us there if it was filled with hardened criminals. It was just filled with harmless thugs. Well, at least for us. He took a sip of his small coffee mug. Still it's a bit sad to see him so friendly with villains. It keeps reminding me of what he's been through, and making me wonder if he's truly a safe individual. This is a concern I've had ever since I just can't help thinking about it. I'm sure Nezu will be able to calm me down. I think you don't really trust our new friend and colleague at least not in the same way you trust every other hero in this school. You think of him as if he was a ticking time bomb. His words make me feel shame but he is right. For some reason, some of his characteristics are strange to me. His relaxed and uncaring nature seems to extend to taking lives too. His charisma may easily turn into manipulation at a flip of a coin. His power could easily be used to start a new crime empire, much like All for Ones, and rule over Japan from the shadows. Maybe it's because of all of these factors that I find things concerning. I didn't think I'd see things this way when I met him. I was just happy at seeing him healthy listen to me, Tashinori. Nezu snapped me out of my thoughts. He glared at me. Bear is far from perfect. But he seems to truly wish for a normal life. That much is obvious, we wouldn't be going through this much if it wasn't true. His words made me look at the ground for a bit. You can see for yourself. How positive the effect that he has on the people around him is. 
So, why are you suddenly suspicious of him? Why can't I find an answer to his questions? Do you think he will become the next All for One? Take these thoughts out of your head. You aren't the only person that hated All for One. Barry's hatred for that man ran much deeper than yours. That statement made me raise my head a bit. Is that truly the case? Barry has never outwardly shown any hatred towards All for One maybe Nezu knows something I don't. I know far too well how it is to be kept as an experiment. I know the hatred he must have felt towards the one that captured him. Barry would likely kill himself if he ever became like him, out of pure spite. It seems I truly angered Nezu this time. He's taking Barry's situation very personally. I can't blame him, I know how irrational my paranoia is. But, I guess I can just stick around and watch him for a while, just to lessen my worries. We will likely be working together anyway. I understand I muttered, looking out the window a bit. The future has a lot in store for us, POV Bear. It's already been a day since I met with Oyama. And, she already got back to me. And told me her plan. Well, she basically got me up to speed about me being a special spy for the Public Safety Committee. That's pretty neat. I always thought it would be fun to become a spy. Maybe I'll be the next Johnny English or something. I'm kinda hungry right now. I might hit the canteen. Problem is that the students might see me. The good thing is that I don't care about hiding A and YMORE so, there's no actual problem psych. I mean, the story is already prepared, and has likely already been leaked. So, I can just go around freely. Sure, not everyone will know about me not being a villain. But the police can't arrest me either. I'm kinda like that young master from a big clan, I know the committee will shelter me. So I don't need to worry. There are please just one more. I really want it she clung to me like a desert dweller asking for water. Fine fine damn, you persistent alright I'll give it to you, I said as I slowly got up and picked her up. She just smiled and locked her hands on my neck. Thanks. This little minx. Her white smile says it all. She's been bugging me to fight her again all day. She's having a bit too much fun dropping innuendos around. I shouldn't let her spend so much time with Nimiri. Oh well, tome to head for the dome where I like to fight people. Guess who's getting scolded by our covery granny today. POV narration the students were gathered in Jim Gamma, trying their best to train before the school festival began. They hadn't managed to do much since the USJ incident. Thankfully, none of them was left traumatized by the attack, instead, they were motivated to do better. Mina also got to see her savior once more, she didn't get to speak to him, but seeing Bear reminded her of the mall incident. It reignited a fire under her, it made her want to get stronger. It also reminded her of that feeling of safety. It gave her a warm feeling as she saw him beat on the villains that had attacked them. Kurishima on the other hand was confused. He didn't think that the villain he sought to bring to justice would be so good-natured. He seemed to get along with the teachers. The colleagues were of vastly different opinions. Some people found him cool, some scary, some found him interesting. Dasuki found him annoying. But Midori found him strange. He knew of his past with All Might. That battle shook the nation. As an avid All Might fan, it shook him to the core at the time. But what stayed with him at the time wasn't how Bear had fought All Might to a standstill. It was his mother's reaction. It was the first time he had seen her burst into sad tears like that. It made him sad too. He then learned from his mother that Bear was a really nice child at some point. To the point where he could have been his brother. Inko had wanted to look for and adopt him, but she was denied any request. She simply couldn't find out what orphanage he was taken to. She had no way of knowing that the government didn't want him to be adopted by anyone. It was impossible in the first place. Still, Izuku was left with a story that gave him quite a bit of perspective. It told him that the world was not truly all that black and white like the media tried to paint it. Sure, the realization was not instant. It took him a while to reach that conclusion. He looked around himself and started asking questions. Is this villain truly evil? And are the heroes really in the right in this situation? Those are questions that weighed on his mind even after he became All Might's successor. After the USJ incident. Izuku ended up confronting his idol, the very hero that he looked up to at all times, All Might, with these questions. The answer he received was simple, but it calmed him greatly. Not all heroes deserve to be praised, not all villains deserve to be vilified, it's the way our world works, unfortunately. It was both what he wanted to hear, and not. Now, he was left to train and wonder how to announce his arrival to the world during the sports festival. His goal was similar to everyone in class 1A well, it was the same for everybody. They all wanted to win, and they were all willing to give it their all to do so. None of them was expecting the class to be interrupted by Bear, again. This time he was with the girl that helped their homeroom teacher during the ESJ. Some didn't even know how to react. The teachers, Cementus, Ectoplasm and Izawa, just seemed to be sweating a bit. Yuro could slightly hear Izawa mutter something under his breath, that idiot that made her chuckle a bit. Which made some of her classmates look at her oddly. Oh he didn't know this place was in use, said the villain while staring at the classroom. Everyone could see Izawa fasp him. As he approached the villain. Everyone relaxed visibly when seeing that their teacher was not preparing to fight the villain. POV bear. You fucking idiot. What are you even doing here? Jeez, never seen Izawa swear like that. Ectoplasm just scratched the back of his head. But I already have a cover, he probably thinks I just carelessly came here or something. I mean, I did, but still, oh come on, the whole farce is over already, they're going to announce it to the public soon anyway, he doesn't seem to get what the fuck I am talking about. But he can play along for now. The committee has already decided to inform the nation of my identity. 
We're both heroes, no need to get your panties in a twist. I said while waving my hand around. I could hear gasps from quite a few people around the room. I could even see some familiar faces around this place. As all was still seemed mad at me. That doesn't explain why you are here, disrupting my class. At least he didn't act like an idiot and question my identity or something. I mean, the gym is big enough for me to spar with Toga in it. It ain't my fault they started paying attention to me for no reason. I said, acting as if I am somehow in the right in this situation. What do you mean? Of course, they're going to get distracted. Did you forget you were supposed to be a villain or something? Jesus, he just won't let up. The best option, in this case, is to feign ignorance. I just hit my palm with my fist and said, oh right. Azawa almost looked like he wanted to smash his head in a tree or something. But I just ignored him and started walking towards Cementus. Azawa didn't bother continuing the conversation. He just took out his phone, probably calling Nezu, who is probably going to tell him to chill out or something. Toga just followed me like a little duckling. She can be kin to cute sometimes. But it's kinda weird that she no longer questions any of the odd stuff that I do am I really that predictable. Hey concrete man got one of those platforms for me. Cementus looked at me with mild irritation. He doesn't really like me calling him that, that's why he also calls me, sure thing, and man. Dokes on him, I actually kinda like it. Ectoplasm didn't speak much, just gave me a nod in greeting. Oh I don't think I forgive you for not coming drinking with me. He instantly looked away and whistled a bit. I was about to grab Toga and fly it to a random place so Cementus can elevate me a platform. But I was rudely interrupted by the students kinda bouncing up and looking at me. Finally one of them decided to speak up. Um excuse me, sir, are you truly a hero? The guy with blue hair and glasses. He seems decently tall for an Asian. You of course what part of me doesn't look like a hero. I said with confidence. Toga just looked to the side for a second. Why do I get the distinct feeling that she's embarrassed of me? The glasses kid just fixed his glasses and nodded. Then started writing some shit down in a random notebook. I see, so a hero's appearance doesn't ma. He kept muttering to himself like a muppet for a bit. He excuse me. A familiar figure finally decided to speak up. Well, they're all somewhat familiar since they were at the USJ too. The pinky seems you've been doing fine how's the hard brat that was with you, no reason to pretend that I don't know her. Although this is technically the first time I've actually spoken to her. She seemed to perk up a bit when hearing me. You remember us that's awesome. No need to get excited, you're like, one of the three people I ever saved dot maybe. A bit more, but still a small group, not a big deal, I said. Then a weird short brat started speaking out. W wait. You know him isn't he supposed to be like a supervillain or something. Geez, at least I've got an announcement board with my past on it near me. Didn't you hear that he's a hero? It's not that big of a deal. Great, they can keep arguing with each other. I unfurled my wings and prepared to grab Toga and take off. Hold on. Can you fight me I've been I've been wanting to face you for a while now Brad with red spiky hair spoke up. Do I know this guy or something? I don't remember him why, if he's fighting someone, I will be the one. I've got a score to set the explosion kid is back great. Maybe some other time, I said as I took off. Then landed back and grabbed Toga who looked at me like I was an IDIOT fair enough. We started sparring soon after, the rest of the class returned to their usual training soon after. Although I could see some of them staring our way. Toga is being really fierce today. She's fighting quite aggressively, seems like she's learned a bit from our previous fight. Her slashes are wilder, less lethal, but more difficult to dodge. Her defense still has holes, and her new wild way of swinging her knife, leaves her open for counters. Every time I found an opening I sent a jab her way. She always got staggered by them, I specifically aimed for the face and stomach. Slowly, her wild style became more careful and restrained. It kept its difficult to dodge swings, but they lowered in intensity as she also focused more on dodging attacks and landing opportunistic shots. It ended when I kicked her in the stomach, making her drop her knife, then I circled behind her and caught her in a rear naked choke. I held the choke hold for a bit. Then I noticed something. Why is she turning red? Must be the lack of oxygen oh lord, she's enjoying this. I mean, fair enough, I don't know what I was expecting. Eventually, though, she did pass out. And I know when to stop, so I let go of the hold and gently placed her on the ground. She managed to get a few good cuts on me, again. I avoided and blocked anything that might have been vital. I took her and flew down, the rest of the class also seemed to be over. The students were gathered around Azawa. The man in question looked at me for a bit. You should be more lenient with her she's young. It's nice to see him concerned over Toga. At least she's making friends. Pain is a good motivator, and she's a quick learner I know how to hold back nice of you to care though. He just cited my answer. After that, I just left for the infirmary. Guess is getting scolded by recovery granny again POV narration the news about Bear's true identity, spread like a wildfire. The government officials that were after Barry did their best to stop the news from spreading. But their efforts were in vain. They were forced to pull back a bit with their vilifying strategy. Oyama being meticulous in the way she spread the news helped greatly. She sent it to all major news outlets that weren't in cahoots with said officials, by the time they noticed such rumors circulating, it was already far too late. Barry quickly became the subject of discussion across all of Japan, even reaching the international stage soon after, as details about his backstory became clear. His story brought attention to the incompetence of law enforcement inside Japan. No one would mention that Bear was targeted by the state after all. 
Barry's story was considered the tale of a tragic hero. The news even mentioned him as an upright character that would never stand for any injustice. That article made Barry piss himself laughing, but that is unimportant. The people believed it, and that was all that mattered. The people that supported him now did so loudly, many fandoms being created after his image and his feats. Many speculated that everything, even his fight with All Might had been planned. Which gave people a bit more perspective on why All Might had tried to somewhat save Bear's name in the past. It painted the picture of a friendship between what now people consider to be the two strongest heroes alive. The excitement was not just in Japan, it even managed to spread overseas, as Bear's image became the one of a martyr. A righteous hero, completely unbothered by how others perceive him. The media campaign worked perfectly, and now Bear could walk in the light as a free man however, the officials were only angered by this development. They weren't going to give up so easily. Now, they were forced to back off in front of the people. But they would definitely keep pestering and trying to create issues for Bear if left unattended. At least that's what Oyama figured would happen soon. She knew just how greedy some of them were. Although they weren't exactly threats to society, so they were usually not the type of people that she needed to worry about. Now, because of her new business partner, she had to work against them. It was a bit frustrating, but she also knew that an associate with Bear's strength and Minsa would only benefit the public safety committee in the long run. She could see just how uncaring Bear was about getting his hands dirty, and that was exactly what she wanted in the people that worked with and for the public safety committee. And just like that, overnight, Bear became a hero. POV Bear. I woke up in my perfectly fine dorm room. I was obviously not alone, this room is mine as much as it is Toga's. She's clinging to me like a squid again, this has become the norm after a week and a half of sleeping in the same room honestly. I don't even mind, she may have her crazy moments, but she's otherwise quite a regular gal. Not much difference between her and some of the other kids I saw around. To wake her up, I always have to get creative, physical contact with me seems to have a strange effect on her, I can poke her cheeks and pull them till they come off, and she will still be sleeping. So, the best way to wake her up is to warp out. It also helps train my control with Kurajiri's warp gate quirk. It's easy enough to use, but I've yet to master it completely. If I was to not be careful, I'd probably also warp Toga with me, and I'm trying not to. She usually clings to me harder if I do that, I manage to warp myself to the side, slowly and carefully, the purple mist stayed away at my body, and I reappeared at the side of the bed. After mumbling a bit and turning around on the bed a few times, Toga also woke up. She could likely sense a distinct lack of me on the bed. Morning she just nodded her head and went into the bathroom by herself. That's a bit rude considering I was up first. Now I have to wait for her or I could just go eat first. It's still early so there can't be all that many students around. Spoiler. I picked the second option, I made my way towards the canteen, lunch rush is usually already prepared at this hour, so I don't need to worry about starving. I think it's because students sometimes choose to live in the dorms at school. Not everyone does that, however, as most prefer just picking an apartment nearby. So anyway, there I was, making my way towards the canteen when I ran into Pinky. And Jesus that's probably the shittiest nickname I ever gave anyone. She smiled a bit when seeing me. Hello. It's great to see you around the school. She immediately strikes up a conversation with me. Hey great to see you too cutie fuck, I meant to say P-U-D-D-I and another shitty nickname, I can't even correct myself, taking that back might make her think I'm insulting her or something. She turned a bit red and looked around for a second. I'm wanna go grab some coffee or something. I can wow it's like you're reading my mind let's go right away, I grabbed her by the shoulders and started dragging her around a bit. I'm doing my best to salvage the situation, I hate awkward moments. B but I have classes she said as she turned even redder. Well, I guess she's technically turning a light shade of purple. I'd usually associate purple with disgust or something, but her skin is already pink, so it's a bit hard to read. Don't worry you won't miss any classes start in an hour or something literally, I hear that they are still training for that useless festival or something. I mean, are they training to become heroes or exposition fighters? Wait, why are they so similar? I see. We kept walking towards the canteen, I stopped dragging her along but she also decided to start walking herself. We reached the canteen, grabbed ourselves some coffee and sat down. I was going to eat, but I'm not exactly hungry anyway. I dragged this gal here because it would be boring to come alone. Um, I have a question. She's the first one that broke the silence, speaking up while looking at me for a bit. Go on I don't bite unless I want to take a cork or something. Is that girl from before is she your girlfriend? I thought it was something more important. Why is she even concerned about this? Now nah, him just taking care of her, I said as I sipped from my coffee. Is it a sigh of relief? Oh is it one of boredom? It might be the second one, I doubt she's having all that much fun talking to a bloke she barely knows anything about. What color do you like most? Oh? We're getting into more existential questions, are we? Well, this is difficult. But I guess I kinda like Kurjuri's portals. Purple kinda like your cheeks when you're F L U S T E R E D or disgusted, can't tell yet, I made a comparison that she can understand better. I don't feel like trying to explain certain shades of purple till I get the correct one. Her reaction is a bit of an odd one though. I can't help but think she's misinterpreting my message. Her entire head basically went purple, is that part of her quirk? Does acid have anything to do with this transformation? T thanks. I'm not really used to this I'm not usually on the receiving end like this would. Why is she thanking me? 
I guess she took it as a compliment, but she's reacting a bit too heavily. It ain't that big a deal. Girls get compliments all the time, sometimes too many. Well, I can't really walk it back now. I don't want to sound mean. Hey Anne, were you really always a hero? I guess she's seen the news. It's been talked about quite extensively since yesterday. Yeah, it was a bit annoying to act as a villain. It was also annoying when they experimented on me. I mean, it technically was. On one side, I could kill P.O.P.L.E. villains with no issue. On the other, I had to deal with self-important idiots that thought themselves to be the center of the universe of all T.I.M.E.S.A.F.O. Oh yeah, the news also mentioned me becoming something akin to a guinea pig for all for one to infiltrate the organization properly. So that's also public knowledge. They needed to add that detail because they had found the files about me in Kaidai's laboratory. I see I know I said this back then. But I wanted to thank you for saving me and Kirishima back then, she really seems genuinely thankful. I can't let her know that I attacked the villains because I wanted to watch a drama. So I'll just boast her something. Don't mention it, I'd obviously save you, I kinda forgot the name of her friend, even though she just told me about it. Oh well, I'll remember it eventually. I, I see she's basically sinking into her seat at this point. Am I making her uncomfortable? Well, I guess her classes are starting soon anyway. Well this was nice, but you should probably head to class I don't want Azawa on my case for kidnapping one of his students. She looked a bit disappointed, but then she looked at the clock, and immediately got up crap. I'm gonna be late. Well, now I feel bad I guess I'll carry her there. I just reached her side and picked her up, she didn't even have the time to react as I started walking out. Azawa did mention where his classroom was located at some point. Mina didn't really say anything the entire way. It only took me about 30 seconds of light jogging to reach the classroom. I also heard the bell the second I reached the door. Here we are see you around I put her down slowly. She muttered a thank you as she went inside and closed the door. By my side, is the usual yellow sleeping bag occupied by none other than Azawa himself. Morning I hope you aren't teaching my students anything weird he said while looking at me suspiciously. Oh, come on what type of person do you think I am I am an upright hero, I can't teach them anything bad, he just stared at me, with narrowed eyes. Well then see I've got places to be, I said as I waved at him and walked away. I think Oyama wanted me to come to see her not long after the news was P-U-B-L-I-S-H-E-D I kinda forgot about it, so that's my next destination. POV Bear. Well, back at the Public Safety Committee HQ. The building looks just as boring as before. The only difference this time is that I don't have to go invisible. I attracted quite a few gazes, I am easily recognizable after all. I don't even need to wear fancy clothes to stand OUT cause, I never even wear any. I did have to talk a bit with Toga before heading out. She ended up just going to her classes to waste some time. She doesn't really need to attend school, although it would be nice of her. I don't think she finds the idea so appealing, but that's fine, not everything requires a degree in life. I remember becoming a programmer in my past life without even bothering to finish high school. I just taught myself the skill and went on with my life. She can do the same in the future. But I somehow don't really see her as the type to pick a boring job and just settle down. We will have to talk about her future eventually. But she will continue to go to UA, at least for now. Nezu's kindness shouldn't really just be thrown out the window for no good reason. He's doing his best to help her fit in too. The villainous quirk doesn't matter much in a hero school. No one will ever look down on her for it in this place. Just like people don't fear me anymore now that I took the moniker of a hero. I also got to pick my own hero name and title. I just chose Bear the Ant King. Since I kind of liked the way it sounded. The king part was just suggested by Mick to spice things up a bit. I just wanted to be called Bear the Ant at first. But I figured adding something like that sounded cooler. And that's all the motivation I need really. Walking on the streets freely, in the light of day is a lot more liberating than I thought it would ever be. People staring at me, this time not in disgust, but either with pity or idolization. It's a bit annoying, I'm not exactly used to being the center of attention, and I don't really appreciate having paparazzi after me. But it seems that my fame comes with those disadvantages. The only advantage it has, now that I think about it, is that accusations can't really be thrown at me randomly. I am a public figure with enough supporters, so a lot of the criticism waged against me will just be blocked by them. I've looked into those things for an hour or two before coming to the HQ, while Toga was wasting some time in class. There are still enough news outlets trying their best to show that I am an extremely violent individual. They do have the evidence necessary for that claim. I did hunt down quite a few villain groups when working for All for One. But people seem to be brushing those off quite quickly. Things like, he was undercover and he is a hero, he just dealt with villains. A common thing said about me when those articles pop up. I walked right in the front door of the public safety committee. Some of the employees seemed quite surprised to see me. I guess not everyone will be informed of my arrival. The receptionist was though, and she directed me towards Oyama's office. This time, there were no guards around. You'd think that she would always have them with her when meeting me, but I guess she no longer sees the need for it, since we are technically working together. Hello glad to see you so soon, I said as I tilted my head a bit, my antennas following my motions. Yes, I am quite glad to see you too, but I'm afraid I don't have only positive news to give you. She said as she looked at me with the same cold eyes. I figured are they not letting up. It's quite obvious. Why would government officials ever care about public opinion? They don't need votes, they're already in power. Indeed, they will soon start targeting you and looking for weak spots. 
I have solved your problems on the legal front, but they can still act from behind the scenes. She seems to be quite pleased by my understanding of the situation. But, in all honesty, this all feels quite boring and simple. I can even somewhat guess what she is going to tell me next. I need your help, I need you to dig into their personal and professional lives respectively, and look for cracks. Look for evidence that I might be able to use against them. Are you up to the task? I guess she thinks this job might be complicated for a teen. But, the joke's on her, I've done this before. When politicians are phased by aggravated violence you need to intimidate them using other methods. Usually, Vlad handled the part himself, he was really good at gathering dirt on others. But I also did it myself once or twice, earlier in my career. So I do know some of the methods to acquire information. Of course just give me their names and some basic information I can take care of the rest, I said as I patted my own chest. She then showed me a rare, pleased smile. Sure. Here it is she handed me four folders, all of which contained some basic information about the people that were after me. Outright killing them wouldn't be the greatest solution, but I am not ruling it out in case they have a clean record. If I can't find blackmail material, I will have to create it myself. You can fill each folder with the respective information. I don't expect a quick response. But know that the faster you take care of this, the less time they will have to intervene with your personal life. Okay, so hurry up and do this shit, otherwise, you're the one that's gonna regret it later. Got it. Corporate speak isn't really my favorite. Vlad was at least a bit more straightforward when speaking to me. But I can't at least understand it. I just nodded and left. I warped the folder she gave me back to my room. I only kept one of them. I don't think it will take this long. I'll start with the closest. The Ministry of Finance, I don't care about his name all that much. Quite far, but I can reach his home quickly enough. He should currently be at work, so I have some time to explore his humble abode. I flew over there in around a minute. I took my time to read a bit more about him. Oyama seems to already have some speculations about the stuff this guy has done. It's just my job to obtain evidence of these things. His villa was in the middle of a Shizuoka, quite a large city. He obviously has one of the biggest estates in the country. Guarded by quite a few people and cameras all around it. There aren't all that many inside though. Most of the cameras are outside surrounding the perimeter. Infiltrating this place looks easy enough. I can just turn myself invisible and manipulate the temperature of my body to match that of the outside. I don't remember what quirk allowed me to do this, but I think it's the combination of some quirks and animal characteristics. So I don't really remember the origin of it. If I were to guess though, it would probably have to do with some animal that has cold blood. So a lizard or something. Regardless, I can pass by undetected from both the cameras and the people inside. Still, I flew in carefully. It didn't take me long to find a blind spot to open a window. I entered the house through a small side window that took me to a large bathroom. This place is bigger than my previous room Akai Dai's L-A-B-O-R-A-T-O-R-Y-W-T-F. Who needs this much space? What is a single man even supposed to use this for? Orgies. Whatever, I've yet to find anything incriminating and I'm already shocked. The corridor was in view of another camera, so I can't just randomly open the door. But then I remembered something and realized that I'm a retard. I have a warp gate quirk, and I can basically see through this whole house. What, the actual fuck, is stopping me from just warping myself in? My stupidity is the answer to that question. So I just warped myself into the dude's office. It wasn't that hard to spot, it was the only office looking room of the house. Although most of it looks boring. It doesn't even have that nice looking ancient Japanese feel to it. So this house is kind of bus. This man definitely likes his privacy, there is not a single camera in this entire room well, besides the small safe to the side. There's a camera inside it. It also has quite an alarm system. It will likely set off if it's open in any way besides putting the code in. But it seems the camera is also tied to the opening of the safe door. So, if I don't open it. I wouldn't even need to worry about the camera. I took my time and explored the room, not really bothering to cover my traces, since I don't really care about him finding out. I didn't find anything truly interesting. It was just boring and regular work stuff. Eventually, though, I realized that the spicy details of his crimes should be in that safe. It seemed to be filled with documents, as well as a logbook. I did the obvious thing and just teleported all of them to me. I started looking through them and found quite a few interesting documents. He has the deeds to quite a few buildings in there. But the logbook is where the real shit was being kept. It was an accounting book, it held the details of some of the payments for these estates. The sources of the money are poorly explained and relatively shady. I think Oyama might be able to look deeper into these things. I'll just take all of the papers to her. She's bound to find more important stuff here. I just warped all of them to my home, and then warped myself back there too. Now, where should I keep heaps of important documents till I give Oyama my report? I have a perfect idea. I'll just leave them on my desk, in their respective folder. It sounds stupid, but there really isn't anyone to look through my stuff in this place. After I was done with that, I just went and spent the rest of the day doing meaningful things. Like hanging out with Tashi and Toga. I think I'll visit Naoko's father, too since it's been a while. POV Bear. This morning I have big dreams. I want to achieve the impossible. I want to reach for the stars. I want to actually be able to get out of bed without using warp gate. But we all know that's never gonna happen. Toga is, as always, stuck to me. I don't actually mind this. 
I may be joking about it a bit, but it's actually quite enjoyable. She's a sweet gal, I hope she will have more success living a legal life. Although she might need my help with that. At least for now. This morning proceeded much like the last. By now, the news about me being a hero should have reached even the slowest of people. The media has been talking about it non-stop, and I really am getting bored of being painted as some type of perfect hero. It's always an extreme, either the most heinous of villains, or the most upstanding of heroes. I find it somewhat nauseating. But I guess this is the way this world works. A thinly veiled lie to keep the masses in check. The Hero Public Safety Commission is apparently tasked with making sure there are no threats to the system that was created. Nezu told me a few things about them, but I still don't know the full scope of their operations. I have quite a lot left to learn about them. But I am at least not deeply tied to them. We are just using each other. Oyama needs me to take care of some stuff for her, and she makes sure I am not going to get arrested. But I guess this is how most deals work. I left myself quite a bit of leverage in the deal though. I left while Toga was showering again. I made sure to leave her a note to tell her about my whereabouts. I just said I'd be flying around for a bit. I obviously don't plan on mentioning that I need to break into the office of the Ministry of Defense. Which, from the files Oyama gave me, is located inside a high security military base. No freebies this time, it's got cameras everywhere. The guards are also patrolling the area around the office frequently. And, to add more to the mix. The Minister of Defense himself is currently at work, in his own office. Now, I could wait for him to get out of his office and go in later. But I have no idea when that is, and I have no intention of waiting around the entire day to find out. This guy doesn't seem to have anything like a safe in his office, so all the stuff I might find is in the piles of documents on his desk and in the desk. I decided to do something smart, I just teleported all of the documents inside the guy's office to my room at UA, I'll sort them out later. I could see the Minister of Defense panic on seeing the way everything on his desk vanished. It was quite fun to see him call in security and start running around like a headless chicken. Boy, this is quite fun. I wasn't expecting this to be so easy. I guess there aren't many people that are capable of doing this. I might actually be the only one. And, since this has been so easy, I might as well pay a visit to the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communication. It's not like I have anything else to do with my day. He lives somewhere around Tokyo. Finding his house and breaking in wasn't all that hard. He was also not really there, so I did take some time to read some of the stuff in the room while sitting in his chair. I managed to find quite a few interesting things. Incriminatory to say the least. Methods of controlling the flow of information, ranging from subtle mind control to actual dystopian shit. To be fair, I should have expected to find this type of shit. But I didn't think he would hold all of this important stuff at his home well, I guess it makes sense. This place is much better defended than the villa of the Ministry of Finance. This guy clearly cares a lot for his own security. There are cameras everywhere. Only the office doesn't have any. But there are motion sensors in the office. I'm sure my appearance has raised the alarm, but I've only been here for like 5 minutes. So either the system is malfunctioning or something else now that I think about it, the room has been filling with this sweet smell. The windows also seem to get locked, as well as the doors. So I guess the system is supposed to poison the person inside to death. What an innovative and interesting solution. Oh no. Anyway, I kept reading things around for another 5 minutes, after which I just warped everything back to my place. I figured I don't actually need to sort these out myself, the Hero Public Safety Commission can take care of that. So, I guess I should go and take these files to Oyama. I only have one more to do, but I already gathered a lot on these three. And my room is getting a bit filled with random papers. So, I worked home and then proceeded to take a quick shower. Toga was still sleeping on my bed, so but I guess it hasn't even been half an hour. I don't really want to smell like poison when visiting someone. Toga also happened to come in, it's technically still morning since not all that much time has passed. Were you supposed to be flying around? And what's with all of the stupid papers? She asked while washing her face, completely disregarding my privacy. I fly fast aren't you kind of late for classes? She just looked away for a bit. They're so boring though. Are you going to be out again today? Great, she's planning on skipping classes already. Not that I blame her or anything. I know how boring school can be. I'll have to go soon don't think it will be so long, do you really need to? I mean, we can just spend the day sparring or having fun. As nice as that sounds, I do have to actually work, can't really be stolen right now. After I'm done collecting blackmail I'll have to see what Oyama has in mind for my missions. This one didn't really count since it's basically helping me. I won't take that long I'll probably be back here in another half an hour, she skulked and just left the bathroom. I mean, fair enough. She can throw a tantrum or two, I don't care. I'm a busy man with responsibilities. I haven't even taken the time to visit now yet. And you won't see him skulking about. I just warped myself in front of Oyama's office. The security guard stationed at the sides instantly tensed up at the sudden appearance of Purple Mist, but their lax after seeing it was just me. I knock on the door and enter Oyama's office. She was looking through some papers, trying to appear busy. Sup, I said as I entered and took a seat. Greetings Barry it's great to see you around so soon. I think a mission just came up for you. Great, straight to business huh? Well, no need to waste time. Great I've also gotten the materials on the government officials all that's left is that scientist guy I warped all of them on her table. 
The three folders were on top of each respective file. It had seems to be a lot more than I expected. She looked at the towers of paper that I had brought her. I just grabbed everything figured you'd have a use for them, I said innocently. I see but you don't need to bother with the head of the largest research institute in Japan. It seems his interest in you has already faded, at least that's what I've gathered from a conversation with him. She started looking through the files that I brought her while speaking. This doesn't sound all that great. The scientist probably wanted me to find out more about my quirk. I've no doubt that he wouldn't have found anything though. Not even Kaida could. I think he should be looking into the other Nomus, I just hope he finds a way to undo what was done to them. Although the probability of that is quite low. I see so, what's my mission? I said while stretching my legs a bit. Well earlier this year one of our more important members defected. She also took down the old chairman of the association. She holds information that could prove to be quite threatening for us. She started giving me a rundown of my mission. So you want me to capture her? I asked while stretching my WINGS I get bored when idle, well I'd prefer if you were to get rid of her. But finding her won't be so easy. I can only give you so much information on her. She's still looking through the papers is this conversation so boring? It is for me, I get it I'll take care of it, she handed me another file. Just the basic information about her. Apparently, she goes by Lady Nagant. Her quirk is called Rifle, she basically touches her shoulder with her own hand, and her elbow opens up and becomes a fucking gun. It sounds pretty cool. But there's no other description for it. And her whereabouts are completely unknown. See ya, I said as I teleported away and left her to deal with my mess. I wonder if Toga is still mad at me POV. Narration now Izumi, the father of Kota Izumi and a great friend of Bear. The news about his new identity was quite weird to hear for him. He was glad that his friend had finally managed to leave a life of crime. But he also was afraid that he had now become a member of the Hero Public Safety Commission. He had heard unpleasant rumors about that place through quite a few circles. Things wouldn't have been all that bad if the people that had started those rumors didn't all disappear or get branded as villains soon after. Overall, he didn't know for sure what his friend had gotten himself into, but he didn't like the way things looked. He was at least glad that his friend could now walk freely. Now, he could finally go and drink coffee with him in public. Although Bear would much more have preferred actually drinking alcohol. Now was just not that type of man. Our Y.O.K.O. his wife, also wouldn't have been too pleased about him drinking. He was not the only one rejoicing at the news of Bear's real identity. Inko Midoriya was in a much better mood when hearing about that. She had gotten attached to the child long ago, not long after Izuku. But her inability to find him again left her quite devastated. Even as she now had her own problems, and her own child, Bear still came to her mind from time to time. I wonder what became of that boy. Her silent question was answered eventually. Seeing him on the news as a villain broke her heart. Leading to her crying in front of her son. Something that she didn't quite like to do. Still, now, everything was better. As Bear was revealed to be a productive member of society. And Inko couldn't have been more pleased. She even went to the point where she asked Izuku to invite him to their house for dinner. She wanted to find out more about him, from him. But, even more than that, she wanted to see if the child still remembered her. Although, Izuku was feeling quite awkward about that invitation. How exactly would he approach the insectoid hero? Would he even accept? Would he laugh at it? That's just common anxiety at work. Currently, Bear was looking for Lady Nagant. As he had no idea even where to start with her. This must have been the reason the commission assigned him to this particular mission. Even when they branded her as an outlaw and spread her image everywhere. She still didn't appear at all. Actually finding her location would be a risky endeavor. And President Oyama figured that giving Bear this task would be the best way to go. Still, she started preparing the manpower and planning for a different solution. Just in case Bear failed in finding Nagant. Oyama was very much aware that this mission was similar to finding a needle in a haystack. She wasn't even able to find enough information to make things easy for Bear. So, she didn't take this mission as a given success. Even with Bear's strength. Bear already searched through the entirety of Musatafu for the duration of the day. But he didn't manage to find anyone with Lady Nagin description and appearance. He ended up just wasting his day flying around and staring at people through the walls of shady buildings. By the end of it, he was banging his head on walls out of boredom. That and cursing Oyama for even considering giving him such a mission. POV Bear. Really, what the fuck am I supposed to do? Lady Nagin could be anywhere in the country and beyond. It's not like they can oversee all types of transportation perfectly. I'll stop wasting my time with this bullshit and just head back to you. Toga should also be waiting around in my room at this point. At least I think so, she's still a bit mad at me for not spending all of my time with her. I think she's aware of how selfish and childish her actions are. But I also don't think she can help it all that much. I warp myself back into my dorm. Toga was just sitting at my empty desk and twirling the knife I gave her while staring at the walls. Is this all you do when I'm not home? Yeesh, no wonder she can't seem to spend much time alone. She's not even doing anything even remotely entertaining. Bear. You're back. She jumped out of the chair instantly. Like a startled raccoon, I need to find better comparisons. Obviously why are you so gloomy? It's pretty clear now that she's no longer mad at me in any way. But seeing her stare at the walls with a bored sad look in her eyes is a bit depressing. I don't know. I'm just bored I guess she put her hands behind her back and tilted her torso forwards. 
There must be more to it you've been like this for a while I mean, it's better to confront her about it. It's clear enough that she's not exactly having much fun. Something's on her mind, something that she is probably afraid to ask about. I need to force it out of her somehow. I don't know. I'm Kwantoka you know I'm here for you why are you so hesitant all of a sudden? I started patting her head while speaking. A bit of coaxing should do. Oh okay bear. I want to kill someone she looked down as if she's ashamed or something. All of the people in my class, the teachers, everyone around us know, even you I get along with everyone so well. But I can't help it. I want to kill them, I want to take their blood and transform into them, there it is. The old one too. I can at least somewhat relate to her well, not the blood part. But there was a point in my life where I was so obsessed with fighting that I wanted to fight and kill everyone around me. Friends, foes, family, no one was out of my range. In the end, I grew out of it. I stopped taking much pleasure in fights in general. It became boring, the danger is only appetizing for people that have only lived a peaceful life. For me, it was a day-to-day -day occurrence. At least until I came to this world, and I had to go through all of that again. It passed much quicker this time though. I stopped caring much after finding out that All Might is quite literally the strongest man alive. I reached the same point that I was at in my previous life. Maybe my experience can help her somewhat. That's natural she immediately snapped her head up and looked me in the eyes. Her large eyes whitening a bit as she did so. So that's the way you are you can't help it now, but you wouldn't be like that forever I was once in a similar situation, she looked at me with the same white eyes, she's completely concentrating on my words. H how you seem just fine she said in a hushed voice, her eyes narrowing a bit, seemingly in disbelief and suspicion. Does she really think I am perfect or something? Why would I bother lying to her about something like this? To fight and kill the desire to fight and kill everyone I met it was an animalistic wish, stemmed from my inborn talents as a fighter, her eyes widening once more. This time, in understanding. As so what changed? What made you change your view? You don't seem to be holding back as I do you don't seem bothered at all. She once again stared at her feet. Maybe in shame, maybe in confusion. What's the point of fighting and killing? It's all the same. The same motions, the same screams, the same anguished faces, the same taste left in my mouth I said as I walked around Toga and sat on the bed. Everything is the same so what's the point? Why am I wasting my time like this? She turned her head and looked me in the eyes once more. These are the thoughts that made me realize who I truly am Toga you are a sweet girl kind a bit obsessive a bit impulsive, she turned a bit red at my description of her. But ask yourself this how will this person's blood taste any different from the last? How will this kill be more exciting than the last? Maybe that might help you see things from my perspective, she finally sat back down on her chair. I think she might need some time to ponder on my words. I don't expect her to change for now no, it takes a long time to get out of that mindset. I think I want to kill someone right now, she looked down in shame again. Then she raised her head at me, pleadingly. There was also quite a bit of fear in her features. Does she think she's disappointing to me or something? I am no saint. I no longer consider killing to be the best thing since sliced bread, but I still do it without hesitation if the need arises. Sure I know just a place, I said as I slowly stood up. I could see her eyes shine when hearing my response. I guess she was expecting me to say some stupid stuff about abstaining in moderation. But that's not really in line with what I did. I would have actually recommended that we go and hunt down a few people sooner or later. I mean, I did pretty much kill people until I became numb to it. I didn't really want things to go the same with her. But I know that holding back is a lot more harmful. It's better this way. As seriously. Are you sure? You're supposed to be a hero now, she also got up and grabbed her knife. Oh we're doing hero stuff just anonymous and with a few fatalities it's fine, I said while waving my hand. I made a portal for the two of us. She smiled and grabbed my hand. We walked into the portal, the smile on her face was one of relief and excitement. We stepped into the portal, the wind going through Toga's hair, as we appeared on top of an apartment building in one of the shadier parts of Musatafu. I did thoroughly look through the city so I obviously know all of the villain hideouts. I'll just drop Toga off at one of them. Let Toga get her fill. Until the glass overflows and it reveals how little any of this matters. I don't need to help, I don't need to do anything. I'll watch over her, with a look of acceptance and a heart full of melancholy. Of all people, why did I get attached to someone so closely resembling me? I guess opposites don't always attract the most POV bearer. I waited a bit, sat on the edge of the building while looking around. I checked on Toga a few times. She had gotten injured once or twice, but overall, she had taken down around 32 people. She consumed their blood and turned into different people at many points, creating confusion in the large group. She was rapidly switching in between transformations and taking people by surprise repeatedly. Her strategy made the fight much easier. I remember the first time I saw her use her quirk. She transformed into me, it startled me at first, but it was also a bit fun to see. It seems like she can only copy appearances, she even copied my voice. But she didn't really copy the toughness of my exoskeleton or the sharpness of my claws. So it's purely cosmetic. Still, a pretty great quirk. But it's not horribly interesting. Apparently, she has enough blood for me to stay in my form for at least a week. Well, enough about that, I have to watch over Toga after all eventually, she came out. She had the appearance of a middle-aged man, covered in blood and gore. The knife that I gave her had been soaked in more blood than it had ever been. I jumped down, arriving in front of her as she transformed back into her original form. 
The grayish slime covered her body and undid her transformation. It left her naked in the middle of the alleyway. I wore a blanket and covered her with it. She looked up at me with glee. I just sighed in frustration. It's always annoying that she has to take her clothes off to properly utilize her quirk. She had to enter the hideout transformed as me. Mainly because I didn't want people to ogle her, even if they were going to die afterwards. Well, no reason to let my prejudice against exhibitionism ruin her fun. Did you have fun? My question was only a formality, the smile on her face said it all. She had a lot more fun doing this than regular sparring. Even though she got injured a bit. It's mostly bruises, and a single cut across her back from a knife. This was the best. Did you see me in there it was so awesome. She jumped around in excitement, forgetting about her WOUNDS and nakedness, and hugging me. Of course you fart nicely let's go home now I'll patch you up, I can't really take her to recovery granny as she's now. I don't want any suspicion to rise. Besides, I can take care of minor wounds by myself. I can also heal most of her bruises with that weak ass healing quirk I still have, maybe I should get recovery granny's quirk. Meh, I don't know, I'll see about it. I can't really think of a good method to ask for DNA from her. Hey granny, you're looking fine. How's about you give me some blood or hair or something? Yay, it sounds stupid. She also has her hair caught up all the time, so collecting any strands randomly is a n n o y i n g also disgusting, but I ate live snakes, so I can't complain, I'll figure something out. For now, I just created a portal to our dorm room. Toga skipped in, I waited a minute or two, giving her some time to dress up a bit. I also called the police from a random payphone. I used the voice of that fatty that I consumed the blood of before, and I only gave them the location. They can figure out the details by themselves. I usually use a more distorted version of the voice of that weebu swordsman with red hair. After I was done with that, I also stepped into the portal. Toga was already wearing her skirt, she only had a bra on though, and she was still putting on her socks. She looked at me with the same, somewhat deranged, somewhat cute smile. Aren't her cheeks hurting at this point? Pretty sure she's had this exact expression ever since she came out of the building also, I didn't really think about this, but thankfully, the cut wasn't bleeding much. She would've made quite the mess of our room. Although she finally calmed down after she stood up. I stooped her from putting on a shirt though, I still have to dress her wound, why were you dragging behind? Did you have something left to do there? She asked, tilting her head with a knowing smile. Goddamn midnight. Teaching my innocent toga to have such impure thoughts. I mean, I did just take her out to call 30 people, but whatever, yeah I had to make a call. Let's get you patched up now can't have you bleeding all over the place I went into the bathroom and brought a first aid kit. I was the one that told Nezu to bring me one, just in case I didn't feel like visiting the clinic after a spar with toga. I first touched her back and used the healing quirk. The cut was pretty long, but it wasn't all that deep. Still, with my shitty healing quirk, I wouldn't be able to close up this wound. I took a bandage and started circling it around her torso. She just stood there and sighed. She sounds like a purring cat though. My you know, this feels quite nice. Maybe I should go topless more often. She said with a slurp. Teasing wouldn't get you far with me unless you're a hot Russian model, but I'll keep that to myself. HMPF, you say that, but I'm pretty sure you enjoy it. She turned her head away and pouted a bit. I mean, she has a point. I do like a bit of harmless teasing from time to time. But I would avoid hitting on a preteen. She can be cute, but that's it, at least for now. I find it hard to look at her in any way other than cute. I sought my healing quirk as her bruises mostly disappeared, I covered her entire back and back in that same bandage. Maybe I use a bit much, but it's been quite a while since I've done this. She got up and stretched a bit, I grabbed her shirt and just threw it on her head. Hey. You'll ruin my hair. She shouted as she started putting it on with an angry face. It can be worse than it currently is oh, that's a mistake. What? She quickly ran into the bathroom and screamed. Her buns were undone and her hair was all over the place. Why didn't you tell me earlier? She shouted from the bathroom as she started doing her hair, again. You didn't ask. I shouted right back. Oh well, this has been fun. I should take her out killing more in the future. But I do have some work to do right now. I'll be going out for a bit. Take care of yourself. I shouted at her and prepared a warp gate directly in front of Oyama's office. Sure. See you soon. It's nice that she's less pissy about me being somewhere without her. After hearing her goodbyes, I entered the portal and directly knocked on the door to her office. The guards were, once more, startled. I guess it is technically almost midnight. But she should still be around this place. Oi, I'm around or no? I asked, one of the security guards just nodded and motioned for me to go in. Okay, Saya, I said as I entered. Bear. I wasn't expecting you to come so late Oi, I started speaking as soon as I entered the room. Well, me either but I do have some stuff to talk about I think the sooner I get it out of the way the better, I said as I took a seat in front of her. Well, speak out. I'm sure it's related to the mission right? She asked as she put the files she had been looking through at the side. Yeah well, I think I will actually rip out my antennas if you give me another mission like this She chuckled a bit, but my frustration is very real No I mean it what the fuck How am I supposed to find a single person in such a large area? I spend this day looking through the entirety of Misatafu she's not here And I can be fucked to do this for every city in Japan I said as I waved my hand in exasperation I could see that she's quite amused at my predicament Honestly, we were expecting such a result Although we were still hoping you'd be able to find her somehow 
Their face reverted to its usual cold look after her amusement died down. We've already devised a strategy to draw her out. It's quite simple really. But I will need you to take part in the operations. She said as she took out another file for me. The plan is written down in here, as well as the dates and locations for every part. You just need to do your part, we will take care of the rest. The cold eyes gazed at me, I just nodded. K.A.Y. understandable, have a great day, I slowly got up. I'll look into the file later, it's already late after all. I worked away as I waved on the goodbye. She just responded with a nod. I worked directly in my room and threw the file on my desk for later reading. After which I just jumped on my bed and buried my face in my pillow. I then turned around and stared at the ceiling. Toga came out of the bathroom soon after, looking a bit surprised to see me. Well, that was quick I was expecting you to be gone for a bit, I kinda wanted to do something she said while looking a bit coy. What does she want to do? I'd rather not ask. But I already know since I'm not that dense. Did that in the shower or something, Min, let's sleep, she just turned red and jumped in bed. She must have been tired because she passed out as soon as she hit the pillow. She didn't even entangle me yet, although I guess she usually does that in her sleep. I guess I'll follow in her footsteps and get my beauty sleep. POV bear. Now, I regret not reading this shitty plan before accepting it. It's quite shitty. I mean, this Lady Nagin was described as a villain. So, what is the plan to lure her out exactly? Well, orchestrating numerous hostage situations across the nation. How is that supposed to help anyone? Apparently, they are going to do this for the next few months. They will hire an outside group, mercenaries to do the actual hostage situations. Well, I say mercenaries. But they are basically a gang of thieves. They are out for profit and uncaring for the means with which they achieve it. That's exactly how they are described in the files Oyama gave me. My job is apparently to appear and save the hostages when need be. If the local heroes get overwhelmed, it's my job to step in. I also can't allow them to be caught, no matter the circumstance. Getting them out of prison would be annoying. Oyama doesn't seem to trust this group at all, she basically wants me to keep tabs on them. I need to make sure they don't step over the line. Some casualties are acceptable it seems, of course, they don't have any idea that they were hired by the government. They've been contacted anonymously by one of the commission's agents going undercover. From the files I receive, they're pretty strong. Enough that some weaker pro-heroes might have issues dealing with them. Their leader specifically seems to have a sort of metal manipulation quirk, there's not enough information on it, but it seems pretty strong. I need to watch over them both to protect them, if they are about to get caught, and to fuck them over, if they aren't respecting the contract. The hostage situations will happen weekly, and I need to be present and observe the situation from the shadows. Overall, it's a really annoying job that I already agreed to. It's just busy work. Under normal circumstances, I tell Ayama to go finger herself to death and give up on the mission. But Lady Nagin sounds like an interesting character. I mean, she kinda waltz into the HQ of a shady O-R-G-A-N-I-S-A-T-I-O and that she apparently worked for, and just fucking shot their leader. Descriptions about her character seem to be a bit vague. It's pretty fucking clear that the commission will have a bias against her. So I can take their word as shit and find out more about her myself. Now, Oyama speculates that if Lady Nagin is nearby, she is bound to help the hostages from a distance. And, because they can't be sure of her location, these hostage situations will have to go on for a while. They seem pretty confident that she hasn't fled the country though. They also seem pretty confident that she will act when seeing civilians in danger. So I guess she's not much of a villain after all. I mean, putting that title on her head will associate her with other two-bit thugs, murderers and rapists. I mean, I guess she's a M-U-R-D-E-R-E-R kinda, but the same can be said for many heroes. So I guess it's just that she killed the wrong people. There is no public information available about her and her crimes. So I'm guessing it's already been covered up. They just want to catch her kill her to tie up any loose ends. It's quite scummy, but what exactly was I expecting from an organization of this nature anyway? This is pretty standard. I'll see about whether or not they will succeed though. For now, I can mostly just idle around. I might go and look for Namiri. I actually haven't talked to her since we were out for drinks. Why? Because I don't know how much she can remember and I don't like awkward situations. I've also had my hands full with time to waste, so I couldn't see her. Now I will go and see what she's up to. Toga is currently in class anyway, apparently, killing 30 people seemed to do the trick. She's no longer too distracted by her thoughts of wanting to taste everyone's blood. It's bound to come back eventually, kinda like an addiction. Today we have breaking news. A massacre occurring on the west side of Musatafu has left authorities shocked and confused. Color still at Lorai shut down the television and slowly got off my chair. I figured they'd announce the media of this event a bit later. But I guess the lack of clues is forcing them to act. With the amount of blood spilt, most of the walls were painted red. I think it was quite a gruesome sight for the authorities. Toga didn't really bleed, thankfully. I would have had to burn down that entire apartment block otherwise. And that might have caused a bit of a mess for the people living in the area. I warped out of my room and into the teacher's lounge. It was surprisingly empty, did Nezu give them a free day or something? I'm pretty sure they should be here right now. I then decided to warp into the meeting room, which was next door, but who exactly walks when they can teleport? I mean, I don't understand why Kurajiri liked walking around. I warped myself right on top of the table. I crouched down as to not hit the ceiling. I looked around carefully. 
I saw all the teachers just staring at me, maybe next time I should look at them through the wall first. POV narration all the teachers were in the room, Nezu had called them to the meeting to talk more about the SJ incident. The purpose of the meeting was to figure out exactly how the League of Villains had gotten their hands on a work schedule. At first, the principal was suspicious that there might have been a mole. But they simply had no idea who that person could be. Even if All for One was dead and the threat of the League was eliminated, he needed to make sure nothing like this would ever happen again. And to do so, he needed to make sure the school was secure. Then, it just clicked to Nezu. I'm such a fool why don't I just ask Bear? After all, Bear had worked with the League. Hold on. I just had an idea. I'll call Bear. Said Nezu as he took out his small phone. The teachers just looked at Nezu weirdly, making the principal sweat a bit. Don't blame me. I can't always be above everything just as the call started ringing, Bear appeared on top of their table. He looked around sneakily for a second, before realizing that everybody was inside. He instantly appeared at the front door. Oh, what a coincidence. I didn't realize you guys were here. I'll just sit down here. Barry didn't even mention a whisper about his initial appearance into the room. Toshinori just rubbed the bridge of his nose, while Izawa casually applied some eye drops and blinked a few times. Most of the teachers were already used to Barry's uniqueness. Yes, I was just about to call you. Great to see you. Nezu also completely ignored Barry's bizarre entrance. Sure, what's up? Barry asked while stretching his legs underneath the table. Well, we've been trying to figure out how exactly Tenko Shimura had gotten his hands on a class schedule. Maybe you could shed some light on this issue. Asked Nezu while staring at the insectoid. They had all started calling Shigaraki by his real name, not the one given to him by All for One. It was by All Might's request. And it also helped Shigaraki get used to his new life. Barry took a minute to think about Nezu's question. He distinctly remembered not listening to some of the things Shigaraki and All for One were speaking of. But he has still heard of this before. I think Shigi paid some girl with many problems to get it for him. She's a student, here of course too. I don't really know who though Barry had to really look into his memories to remember that specific conversation. It was a good thing he had some memory enhancing quirk. Well, he was now technically as intelligent as all for one. Technically is the keyword here, I see, thank you for the information bear. This gives us a low barrier interjected for a second. I doubt you've actually got a spy though if that's what you're wondering not like Shiki told her it was for a terrorist attack, bear waved his hand dismissively. Nezu had not expected to get that much information from bear. But it seemed like the insectoid was of greater standing within the league of villains than expected. All for one had openly discussed plans in front of him. Understandable, still we probably should find out who exactly it was. Even if we don't punish them too severely. Nezu had some weight lifted off his shoulders with this conversation. Yeah you guys do that I'll just. Oh yeah I guess he slowly got up. Indeed, this meeting is pretty much done. I'll look a bit into the matter myself. The rest of the teachers also got up and prepared to leave. Why do you want to join me? Beru asks while pulling on his own wings. He does it like his hands being idle. Sure, I don't really have classes right now. She then looked at Nezu, who just nodded and left on his own. Great let's go they started making their way to the canteen. The atmosphere around them was a bit more strained than usual. So they didn't speak much. Still, after they took their food from the canteen and sat down in front of each other, they were quite literally forced to talk about the elephant in the room. POV. Arish and Amiri didn't really know what to make from her encounters with Bear. The two of them were both extremely playful individuals. To the point where flirting was a regular occurrence for the two of them. It was quite a thing to witness. Usually, Midnight never flirted with others, it was mostly just jokingly adding sexual innuendos into a conversation. But she found it extremely fun when with Bear. The two of them just clicked properly. Still, she was a bit hung up on his appearance, she repeatedly scolded herself for judging him by that, but she couldn't help it all that much. There was another thing that she knew. The more time she spent with Bear, the more she would want to spend. She clearly remembered her drunken invitation and his calm rejection. She was too embarrassed to look him in the eye after it. Although she cooled down after a day or two. Now, being suddenly invited to eat by him caught her by surprise. It was also awkward for the both of them, as neither seemed to know how to break the ice and start a conversation. It was as if all of their social skill fucked off and they were stuck with their anxieties and worries. Mimuri almost felt like slapping herself. This isn't like me. Come on, say something. But she just walked in silence the entire way. Barry's thought process was a bit different. How does one go about reminding someone of their drunk moments without embarrassing them? He wasn't feeling excruciatingly awkward, he just didn't want to inconvenience Mimuri too much. That's why, when they eventually sat down. He finally started speaking. You know you're quite fun when drunk, she instantly turned red when hearing his strange compliment. If it came from anyone else, she'd just find it slightly creepy and move on. But this was also the guy that rejected her advances when she was clearly drunk. T thanks you were quite great too. I still remember when you broke that pool table we were playing at, and Jiren got mad. She smiled a bit when speaking. She was glad that Bear had been the one to break the ice. She hated being frozen up like that. She didn't even remember the last time she had been like that. It couldn't be that she actually fell for this strange guy right? Yeah I think he didn't appreciate that, but hey, at least I won the game, Bear said while crossing his hands in confidence. What? You clearly lost. You didn't even get close to winning. The conversation proceeded to go smoothly from then on. 
They continued speaking about their experiences, making each other laugh repeatedly. Both of them forgot about the food in front of them. The food got colder as their conversation became more heated. Eventually, they wound their way around the end of that night. So how come you didn't take me up on that invitation? Not that I feel like bragging, but I doubt all that many people would refuse it, she had a curiosity behind that joke. Still, Bear didn't care much about it. Figured that by accepting it I might ruin whatever we have now I don't want that Namiri turned red once again. All of that senseless flirting and those meaningless compliments, didn't amount to anything in front of such an honest answer. She was not expecting Bear to give such a serious answer. But she didn't mind it one bit, no, it gave her a warm feeling. A warm smile spread on her lips as she thought about his words. An honest friend, a person that didn't care about taking advantage of her. She had other friends like that at work, but they were also co-workers. Bear was an outsider that cared for her just as much as the people she had spent half her life with. So, she completely stopped caring about Bear's appearance, she didn't care about his crimes, she didn't care about his past. She only cared for his friendship. She wanted to learn more about him directly, she wanted to find out more from his own mouth, to avoid any misunderstandings. She coughed a bit, taking herself out of her own little world, and looking Bear in the eyes. Thanks, she didn't even know how to put what she was feeling into words. Still, the bell was ringing, she would soon have to leave for her classes. Maybe we can do this again. Really soon? She asked with a radiant smile and rosy cheeks. She still reluctantly got up. She couldn't shirk her duties at work. Sure your pleasant company why would I refuse Beru also got up, his antennas flailed around happily. Good luck with your classes, he said as he looked down at the cold food. Maybe we should actually eat a bit first, Namiri also finally noticed it. They both quickly stuffed whatever they could in their mouths, before quickly running and putting the trays on the used rack. See Namiri just ran, not wanting to be late to her own classes. Beru just put a warp gate in front of her and took her to the teacher's lounge while laughing a bit. He heard a small BANG midnight likely running into the door, and then a loud thank you. From the other end as the portal closed up. POV Bear. That went 100 times better than I had thought it would. But then again, I am a bit of a pessimist. Glad to see she's still as lively as ever. The silent walk over to the canteen kinda had me worried for a second. I mean, it was either that she was embarrassed or that she didn't want to talk to me. Thankfully, it turned out to be the first. Still, her reaction at the end caught me off guard. I didn't even know Namiri could act that cute and bashful. I mean, she's always pretty compassed when I throw compliments her way. But my words seemed to really take her breath away for one second. It was pretty cute, not gonna lie. Well, too bad I now need to get a look at that group of thieves that will be doing all of the hostage situations. Boy Um informed me of their hideout and told me to get a good look at them, make sure that they aren't already misbehaving, and make sure they're capable enough for this task. I mean, the agents in the Hero Public Safety Commission already confirmed their capabilities, but Boy Um wants me to get a good look at them for myself. I only accept it because I'm also a bit curious about them. I mean, they're basically villains hired by the government to act as villains. I'd obviously be interested to see who exactly they are. So, I work myself to that location. They're currently residing in a warehouse, I always end up near one of these what the fuck. I teleported on top of it and stare down through the ceiling and walls. Their leader calls himself Wolfram and is always wearing some weird paint on his face. He's pretty recognizable. They're quite the sizable group. Around 50 to 60 people. The bulk of them seem to just be trained gunmen. But there are a few that don't seem to be carrying any guns on them. I can only assume they have some combative quirks. I don't really have files on all of them, only the leader seems to have been recorded properly. Overall, I think this group should be able to deal with most heroes. At least if someone like All Might or that flame guy doesn't show up. Currently, they seem to be gathered around, speaking and eating takeout. They are certainly relaxed. But I guess they consider the conditions of the mission to be quite cushy. Maybe they have a way to deal with heroes. Oh well, the next attack will actually happen next week. They just came into the country early. After getting a good look at them, I confirmed their numbers and strength, and sent Oyama a message about it. After I was finished, I just warped away again. Really, Kurajiri's quirk is the best thing that happened to me. I arrived back at UA and just spent some time in the teacher's lounge. Speaking with Snipe and whoever was available. Apparently, the school is preparing for a sports festival. The teachers are saying it's quite a big event. They even have a stadium for IT which is kinda over the top, but whatever. It's apparently going to be held in a few days. The students are really fired up to compete for first place. Apparently, even the general course has a chance to be transferred over to the hero course if they stand out. This festival will also be for the pro heroes to extend internship invitations to the students. So it's quite important for them. Well, Tashinori decided to call me to an empty office room to talk about something important. I kinda accept it since it's Tashi inviting me. I'm also quite curious about what he has to say. POV Bear. I slowly entered the empty office room with Tashi. We both sat down and looked at each other for a bit. Su what's up Tashi? I asked with a happy tone. Well, let's wait for a second, I've also called someone else Hero, this is a three-way, then. The conversation you pervs, sure thing, I said while yawning and looking at the ceiling. After around two minutes, another person walked in. To my surprise, it was one of the kids from the Hero course, I've seen him in the past. He's got green hair and freckles, I don't really know his name. And I never spoke to him. 
Pretty sure this is the kid that was mumbling to himself though. He looked quite surprised to see me. Did he expect to be alone with Tashi or something? What exactly is the relationship between these two? Hello. Tashinori, sir. You called me. Well, at least he's not speaking to himself now. Hey, Ying Midori, you take a seat. The kid sat right beside me and we both faced Tashi with a bit of curiosity. So what's the deal with all the secrecy? I was the first one to speak out. Well, I've called you here to ask for your assistance with something. Tashi got straight into it. I just looked at the kid beside me, he seemed to be just as confused as I am. You see, my quirk is a bit special. It's a power stockpiling quirk that gets stronger the more people owned it before. Which means that it can be passed on to others. He looked at me for a bit. Why is he looking at me like that though? Is he expecting some sort of reaction? It's not like this is unheard of, I've got quite a few quirks myself. Well, now that I think about it, it might be somewhat new for outsiders. The kid beside me seems to be looking quite shocked. After seeing my lack of reaction, he just sighed and continued. Well, my successor is the child beside you. Izuka Midoriya I looked at him for a bit, he didn't even have the courage to look me in the eye though. Hey, kid names Baru I patted him on the back, an action that startled him quite a bit. So how's this related to me in any way? Although, I guess I'm flattered enough that you're sharing your secrets with me, I guess his quirk was a mystery for me in the past. I just thought it was your usual strength quirk, not so interesting and all that. But I guess it's not that simple now. Well, this upcoming festival is a big chance for the students to be scouted by pro heroes. But young Midoriya has little control over his quirk I hope that you would be able to train him. Tashinori just gave me a pleading look. Not just train him I ask of you to take him in as an intern after the festival really now. Sounds like a bit of work. But I guess I do owe Tashi a lot. It was with his and Nezu's help that I even had a place to stay at Yue. The kid just looked down in shame. He clenched his fists and looked quite depressed determined. A weird cocktail of emotions really. I guess he hasn't been in possession of it for a long time, but why come to me? Well Tashi looks like he's got some stuff on his mind. I'm not exactly the best of teachers I can be a role model, I can be a hero, but my teaching abilities are limited. And what makes you think I'm any better? When I received this power, I didn't need to worry about hurting myself with it, I just needed to control it to not damage my surroundings too badly, but Izuku the stockpile power is too much for his body to handle all at once. He needs to learn how to limit himself properly to avoid harming himself. So that's the issue here. Well, if you put it this way, I don't really know what to say. POV narration at first, Tashinori wanted to see how his pupil would fare against the competition in the festival. But he knew that even if he won the festival, he wouldn't get any internship requests due to his lack of control. So, he now had two options. 1. Contact one of his old mentors, Grant Torino, and plead with him to take Izuku as an intern, and teach him how to control one for all. But Torino was old, and Tashinori was not feeling too comfortable bothering him with this. The old man didn't react all that nicely to all for one still being alive after all. He didn't need even more stress. Still, this preemptive request for an internship embarrassed Izuku quite a bit. Even worse, it made him think that All Might didn't believe in him. Although that was just because he was blinded by his nervousness. All Might didn't consider the situation as abnormal, Izuku had just gotten the quirk a few weeks prior. He didn't think any less of his pupil. But he wasn't perceptive enough to do much for his successor's confidence issues and anxiety. Baru, however, instantly noticed the change of emotions that Izuku was going through. Baru found the situation a bit odd. He understood Tashinori's explanation, but he still didn't get why he was a viable option for a teacher. All until All Might added this, you've learned how to use and master dozens of quirks, I figured you might be the most qualified person to teach him out of everyone at UA. This cleared up a few things for Bear. At least momentarily. But, in truth, if All Might was in a hurry to get his successor to master one for all, he would have still contacted Gran Torino. As he knew for a fact that he would have been of help. This was more of an attempt from him to get his student pupil, better acquainted with Bear. Their ages weren't all that different, so he hoped that the two could get along. After all, he wanted some assurance that Bear would be able to make friends his own age. The only example of that was Toga, and she wasn't quite normal herself. So he resorted to doing this. Now he was just hoping that Bear would accept the request. POV Bear. Okay then. I guess I can waste some time on this kid. Not that I do much the entire day anyway. Sure I can train him but only during the internship, I don't really feel like training him right away, and I really don't know how much I like this whole training thing. So I'll refrain from making any promises I can't keep. Tashi heaved a sigh and just smiled a bit. The kid, Izuku Midoriya just looked at the ground. I guess I should at least try to cheer him up a bit. I gave him two pats on the BACK maybe a bit harder than intended. He flinched as his chest back was bent by my friendly pats. Cheer up kid you master your quirk in no time I would recommend some more body training, though I slowly got up. I don't really have anything to do right now, but I do have television if I want to waste time. I'm out see Tashi, Izuku I just left the two of them in there. They might have some stuff left to talk about. I arrived and my ROM teleportation never gets old, to find it somehow completely CLEA and I usually don't make that much of a mess, but dust still settled, and I was too lazy to ever clean it up, Toga. Did you clean up the room? I shouted a bit, as I heard the distinct sound of a shower starting and me being ignored. I'm not walking into the bathroom, that's for sure. I don't want to fall prey to one of the most basic of tropes. 
Still, it's pretty nice of her to clean up the room, although most of the mess was made by her. She always left a bra or two around, a dirty uniform. It would have been a bit awkward if I wasn't so leisurely about these things. I mean, I don't even wear clothes, who am I to judge? Oh well, the day continues. POV. Barry Shenand, while Barry was hanging around his room, staring at his television in boredom. Gota Yuri, the man who is the current head of the largest research institute in Japan, was making great progress in his research of the Nomis. The files he had found fascinated him to no end. The most interesting one was by far the one on Bear. The research that Kaidai had conducted on him had been quite extensive. He had also used top-notch technology, and yet, nothing came up. Till the end, he had never figured out the true nature of the Insectoid's quirk. Still, now, he was looking into how all of the Nomis were made, rather than Bear alone. He hoped to find out more when comparing him to some of the others. And, he came to much of the same conclusion Kaidai had reached. Bear's body was completely capable of endlessly supporting countless quirk factors. It was to the point where even after putting all of the quirks all for one had available in him, he still was capable of hosting more. Kaidai failed to see any negative effect that the abundance of quirks might have had on Bear's body. He even concluded that the memory loss that Bear had apparently had was caused more by trauma. Gotoyori quickly became interested in Bear, but he already heard the rumors going around, about the people that had outright expressed their interests in Bear, and how they had been blackmailed into silence. The news circulated fast when it came to that. So, the doctor knew better than to announce his intent to the world. Still, he chose to start looking into a way to capture Bear. And so, Bear's troubles had yet to end. Even after all this time. The doctor quickly got to work, not wasting any time at all. Was his life just bound to be filled with adversity? Maybe, the uniqueness of his existence was the cause of all of his grief, yet, it was also the cause of his strength. POV Bear. The festival started today, and oh by, where the fuck were they keeping all of this budget? Yue was always really huge, but a school festival of all things is being held in a stadium this large. Now, I've heard that it was going to be a stadium, but this thing is bigger than any I've ever seen. It makes one wonder how quirks have affected the cost of labor and materials. Because a school would never have enough cash for something like this then again, this one is supported by the state, and the state takes heroes very seriously, so it might have been possible. Bear. Do I really need to participate? Asked Toga, she was dragging herself along with me, we are currently just outside the stadium, the competition starts in an hour or something. Yeah you're a student now you do student things, my resolute tone just made her roll her eyes. She's currently wearing a regular tracksuit. Underneath that tracksuit, she has a skin-tight costume, made specifically for her quirk. It was made by the support department so that she doesn't go nude in front of everybody. Usually, they don't take requests from the general course, but Nezu was happy to help, like always, that guy's a G, but it sounds so boring she sighed and whined like a little kid. Don't be so lame it's gonna be fun you can even draw blood minimally, my words did seem to cheer her up, quite a lot actually. I took her out killing yesterday, I let her clean up another group of villains, so that she wouldn't be as bloodthirsty today. I wouldn't want her to accidentally kill any kids after all. I guess it does sound fun she still doesn't sound all that convinced. Alright if you get good enough results I'll take you out for ice cream sometime this week, she immediately lit up when I said that. Okay then. She then skipped forward and went towards the student waiting zone. It seems I'm being taken advantage of. She was clearly looking for this type of proposal all along. Oh well, I don't specifically mind that. At least she's having fun. I can also use an outing, spending all of my time either here or on missions is boring. Speaking of missions. Tomorrow is going to be the first hostage situation. I think it's somewhere near Tokyo. I'll have to go and look at them while they kidnap civilians and keep them for ransom. I think the file said that they are going to do that while on a streak of robbing several banks. Those robberies are technically also part of their payment too. Oh well, I'll think more about that tomorrow. For now, I walked around a bit, my appearance obviously garnered some attention. Some people even asked me for autographs, which was quite flattering at first, but it became annoying after 10 or more people asked at the same time. Eventually, I sat down in a place where the rest of the teachers were also seated. Well, at least those that weren't working currently. Mick and Izawa are the presentations, Midnight is the referee, and Cementus has to do his thing and clean up. He is also tasked with taking care that no fatalities happen when the students fight in the last round. This is basically an underground fighting ring, but legal and for high school kids. Which is quite nice honestly. I think Toga has fair chances to win, she's a lot more skilled than the majority of other students. I can't really speak for all of them though, some might have some formal training or something. I mean, it's improbable that out of every kid here, only Toga is somewhat talented in fighting. What's wrong Bear? Asked a somewhat familiar womanly voice. It was 13, I haven't spoken to her in quite a bit. It's nothing serious how have you been? Your voice is as soothing as ever at least I have someone to talk to and tease, while the festival is starting. You um, thanks Bear. I've been fine, I just thought you looked a bit bothered by something damn, she's perceptive. I tried to avoid thinking about this all day. But I really don't trust that group of thieves one bit. I highly doubt anything will go well. Why? I have enough experience dealing with people like them. Opportunistic, greedy. They are criminals, not the type you should be looking to become allies with. But I can't really tell 13 about all of this. It's pretty classified information nah, I don't care about it being classified. But I don't like involving people in my issues. 
I'm pretty fine even better now that you're here say, how's about we get some dinner after all this is over. I continued like that for a while, sending various compliments and invitations to the somewhat shy hero. She didn't really know how to respond, but she did her best to ignore me. I didn't make it easy for her though, I sat right beside her and even put my hand around her. I made sure to back off when if I annoyed her though. Say why are you always like this? She finally decided to stop ignoring me after a while. Her tone is a lot more serious than I expected. That's a bit of a broad question. I can stay here all day and explain how I am flirty by nature, and that I really, really feel bad for unappreciated people. That would make me sound like a self-righteous asset that takes pity on others, and tries to help them looking for validation, and to stroke his own ego. But really, it's a lot more simple than that. It's not all that complicated I guess I like to see people smile. I've been like this all of my life really. Even back at the orphanage, I always did whatever just to get a smile out of Sam. It's just who I am I guess. I wasn't always like this though. I used to be quite the hateful bastard at some point. 13 just looked at me for a bit, I guess she wasn't expecting that type of answer. I see say do you truly like me? Or do you just want me to smile more? That's a bit hard to answer. I wasn't expecting her to get so serious all of a sudden. I do like you a bit not in the way you think though, I find you to be a good person, a friend even someone that I don't want to see skulking about, that's about all I can say early. 13 just look up at me for a second. I can't really see her face, but, somehow, I think I can tell that she's smiling. Thank you really. She finally settled in her seat. As the festival also started. I could hear Namiri giving the intro and even inviting the student that got the highest score in the entrance exam on stage. I kinda dozed off at that point though, I could see Togo looking just as bored as me though. So that made me feel better, at least I'm not suffering alone. No need to look like that the festival gets better after the events start. 13 sat while poking fun at my board a p p e a r a n c e slumped antennas and unfocused gaze. I'll take your word for it, I said while staring at the other teachers. Most of them were also just patiently staring at their own CLASSES I think so anyway. The first event was a race with some obstacles. At first, I thought it was just your regular, jump some fences crawl under some shit race. But then the fucking giant mechs came in. And I actually started paying attention. They also had to pass a giant canyon, I didn't expect a school of all things to make events so interesting. I mean, this is the first time I've actually been interested in a high school EVNT but I'm a dropout, so that might not say much, the last obstacle even turned out to be a minefield. That raised some questions in my mind. Like, what the fuck are these people eating? I mean, I doubt those are actual mines. But still, the explosions seem to carry some force. I mean, I can see Zuku got launched by one quite far away. He even took first place because of it, well, I guess it was more than one mine, but still. But, I guess they aren't in any danger. No way Nezu would approve of it if they were in any danger. Togo also managed to get into the next round, it's a good thing she's got a good physique. She can't really rely on her quirk much, to be honest. I doubt she's going to make much use of it throughout this competition. The next event was a cavalry battle, pretty standard stuff in Japan, from what I've U-N-D-E-R-S-T-O-O-D at least I think so, never was interested to look it up. But this also happens to be a fight between kids with superpowers, so it was a bit more interesting to watch. They all have bandanas worth a certain amount of points. They're supposed to fight over the more so M-E-T-H-I-N-G didn't listen entirely. Togo teamed up with some kids I don't really recognize. I think they're also from the hero course though. She managed to qualify for the tournament too, which is nice. I guess. She almost didn't get in though, just that two people gave up for some reason. So, I guess Togo got far enough for me to take her out for ice cream well, this turned out to be a bit more entertaining than I thought. I can almost smell 13 smugness. The only thing that's missing is an I told you so or something like that. I just got up though, ignoring her gaze and just preparing to leave. Where are you going? She finally decided to ask. Bathroom wanna come? She just stared at me for a bit. I think my invitation failed to fluster her this time. Nah, I'm good then she diverted her attention elsewhere. I walked away after that, I think I'll look for Togo or something. POV bear. Actually finding a toilet in this stadium proved to be more difficult than I had expected. But I did manage to find it in the end. I even ran into a familiar face. Oh flame beard great to see you're still healthy. It was none other than the dude that helped Emmy try to anyway, when fighting all for one. Baru, I had heard that you were at UA, didn't expect to run into you here though, why is this guy so rigid? Did he eat something bad? Well where else am I supposed to be? I do kinda live here I could see the guy sweat a bit. I mean, the stadium is quite big so I didn't think I'd run into ya, I was just messing with you. He seemed to get the message after I tilted my head at him for a bit. I must go now. My Shoto is going to be competing soon. Great, I don't remember asking, but great. I'm glad for why are you assuming you're talking about your son and not a pet or something, hope to see you again sometimes, I said as I waved my hand and continued looking for a toilet. Sure he muttered and walked off. Why is this guy so awkward? He seemed pretty nice when he was helping me. Was he being purposefully boisterous or something? Well, whatever. I finally found the bathroom after 4 minutes of S-C-A-R-C-H-I-N-G don't like asking for directions. I kinda hate having to pee while wearing a watch, but it's not all that bad. Why am I wearing a watch? Well, Oyama wanted a reliable way of contacting me. 
And seeing as I'm not willing to put some pants on to have pockets for a phone, she just decided to give me a smartwatch. It's the same color as my ex's skeleton, and when the screen is closed most people wouldn't even see it. It's actually quite hard to navigate a smart screen when you don't have actual skin on your fingers. But she said that this was made with that in mind, so I don't need to worry too much. The more annoying part about it is that it suddenly started vibrating on me. I looked at the screen to see none other than Cole B-I-T-C-H how I changed Joy Alma's contact, calling me. I obviously responded. It would be a bit rude to make her wait. Sup is always my go-to opening. I'm guessing this is about important business of some kind. Barry, we have an emergency. I can guess from your tone, get to it. You, sure go on, I said while scratching the back of my head. Wolfram and his group have acted today. He said that this would be a better moment since most of the country and heroes are fixated on the festival, she seems pretty stressed. I guess this is basically really bad for them. Since if something major was to happen when such a large event was going on, they'd get into a bit of trouble. I mean, both the NR.1 Tashi and NR.2 Flamebeard heroes are present here. So the entire hero community might get some flack for shirking their duties. They decided to act early. If they just brazenly started doing shit then they'd be going against the contract. They announced me in the last moment. But they should have already started. It's quite far from Yusutafu, so I doubt any of the heroes there will be able to help she said with a sigh. Don't worry I'll just take care of it, I'll make sure there aren't any casualties, I could hear a sigh of relief after I was done speaking. Thank you I know this is unreasonable, you also have your free time after all. I mean, I'm a bit mad, but things would be a bit problematic if Oyama and the commission have a bad opinion of me. So I can't really refuse this. I mean, I already agreed to do the overall mission, shirking on it would be the same as spitting in their FACS after they've helped me. By the way are you near a fountain? I keep hearing water in the background hmm. Though he just have a strong bladder, I said as I finished and retracted my pages. I see well then, we're relying on you I guess, why do I hear so much regret in her voice? Don't worry, I'll take care of Wolfram and his boys, I said as I turned off the watch and washed my HANDS sanitation is important. Now, I guess I'll check out whatever the fuck Wolfram and the others are planning. I mean, I guess they're smarter than I thought. It actually makes sense to carry out a coordinated attack while everyone is distracted. Problem is, not everyone is distracted. They will definitely have to fight some heroes. So I still need to be there to make sure they don't get their asses caught. I also need to make sure they don't go around raping and pillaging like vikings. I already know the proper way to take care of this. There are around 60 of THEM if I remember correctly. I'm sure they won't notice if one of them goes missing for one second and returns with a different personality. I warped myself to the targeted bank. All of the targets were shown to me beforehand. I could see that they already managed to take the entire building hostage. The police had yet to properly secure the perimeter. I could see three of the gunmen come out of the bank through the back. After making sure no one else was nearby, I used my fastest speed to knock out the one that was dragging behind. I quickly dragged him onto the roof of a nearby building, I cut his cheek open and took some blood. I transformed myself into him using Toga's quirk, and quickly flew back behind the other two. It's nice that I don't have to worry about clothes. And, how exactly did I get Toga's quirk? Well, how the fuck was I supposed not to? I sleep next to her every night. Each morning, when I wake up, there were at least 20 strands of her hair in my mouth. Well, that's about it really. I'll just walk around near them, this disguise will serve me well enough if I need to interfere or something. Can't have people recognize me, all of that happened in 3 SCCO NDS record time really, the idiots didn't even notice. Ha. Huh. Did you hear that Johnny? Mark said that Wolfram wanted to do the entire crime spree today. One of the dudes turned around and spoke to me. He was speaking English, which works for me. Oh. That's pretty neat. I said, using the voice of the guy that I knocked out. Still, patrolling around is so boring, I bet the guys inside are already having fun with the female employees, the other guy also started whining. I looked through the walls, everyone seemed to be taking their jobs pretty seriously, so I guess these guys are just idiots. Not surprising since they were basically told to fuck off and patrol an empty parking lot. I mean, maybe they will be doing something later. I'll have to stop them if they do that, why did it have to be a group of thieves of all things? I mean, why Alma could have chosen anybody, literally anything would have been better than this. Who cares if they're trained? They're not even that great I mean, these guys are decent, but I doubt they are the only available group of capable mercs. Well, I guess most of them would have higher prices. People that have a bad REPI. The gang of thieves barely get any big JOBS like this one, so they are easily underpaid without any complaints. I mean, they get to keep the money from the banks, but they aren't really attacking any major banks Johnny. What's up dude? You've been really silent. Asked one of the underdeveloped apes walking in front of me. Nah, just thinking of all the action we're missing right now. I said dismissively, hoping he'd get the message and stop bothering me. Yeah he kept on babbling about stupid shit until we were finally called back in. We wouldn't even have made it back in if not for me. The police have already surrounded the place, and the three of us almost got caught, I had to pull the idiots back inside. Johnny, that was sick. Didn't know you had it in why, I let him talk more as I walked and looked around the bank. The safe was already opened, and some people were loading their bags. Wolfram was speaking through a megaphone to the authorities. He obviously started negotiating a rescue ransom, I don't remember this being part of the deal, I guess I'll need to talk with him now. POV. 
Well from this mission is the shadiest one I've had in a very long time. The employer barely provided any information about himself. There was just some asshole contacting us in their stead. The job itself seems to just want us to cause a scene more than anything. The payment in itself is good, but it's to the point where they could have chosen other, better mercenary groups. Not going to lie, the reputation of our group, especially in Asia, is not good at all. This leads me to believe that we are just being used as throwaways. It's infuriating, but at least that means that I don't need to care about following the script word for word. If I know I'm being used, I can at least profit a bit out of it. Or so was my thought before starting this raid a day early. There's no need to respect all of the dates, the employer never specified that what they needed us for, so I can just do what I was told to. Giving them notice beforehand is mostly out of courtesy, and because I don't want to lose this contract. Even if we're being used, this still pays much better than most of the jobs we did beforehand. Now, we were specifically told not to bother asking for a ransom on our hostages. But that just sounds stupid. If a group wants us to create chaos, what are a few ransoms going to do? Not like this is going against the overall contract, just a few aspects of it. The most they can do is not want me on any of their plans. But then again, I don't plan on doing business with this employer again after this mission is over, so I've nothing to lose. So, as I finished negotiating with the police, I managed to get them to promise quite a decent amount of cash. But, something strange happened, one of my gunmen came towards me. I can't remember his name properly, but he was sent to patrol the parking lot along with a few others. Wolfram, what the actual fuck do you think you're doing? His question instantly made me mad. Since when do my own men dare disrespect me like this? Who do you think you a he interrupted me just as I was about to scold him. For fuck's sake, this is not the time for arguments. Shut the fuck up. I've seen plants more intelligent than you. I'm here to look after your asses and you're not even respecting the deal. Fuck off will you. I then realized that this guy isn't one of my own. The realization wasn't a pleasant one. But why is he even breaking his cover like this? I instantly became vigilant, I signaled everyone for a circle around us. This is bad, I wasn't expecting them to infiltrate us like this. This employer might be a lot more hands-on than I previously expected still, did they send a sailor to oversee us? His vocabulary seems to be quite colorful, who sent you here? I already know, but it would be nice to get a name for my employers. Look dude I really don't care about any of your business just do your fucking job, so I can go home. His voice changed in different pitches and tones, as the sentence wore on. At first, he sounded like one of my men, then his voice gained a strange static to it, then it was completely distorted as if it came out of an old radio. It was strangely creepy, it's also annoying that I can't know for sure what quirk this man has. What am I supposed to do in this situation? POV narration is Bear was chastising Wolfram, the police were trying their best to look for an opportunity to rescue the civilians. Internal strife between the villain was both a good thing and a terrible one. On one hand, it could give them a chance to intervene and rescue the hostages, on the other, it could endanger the lives of said hostages. Wolfram himself knew the tensions would rise due to this argument, which is why he wasn't quite pleased with what was happening. That and the fact that someone dared to infiltrate his group right underneath his nose. Silence. He finally spoke up, with steel in his voice. He needed to act quickly, otherwise, the police would find an opportunity to break in. The only thing stopping them from acting now was the fact that Wolfram's group was quite sizable. Barry was obviously well aware of the way things could go wrong. But, at the same time, he didn't see any reason to stop. Though you dare go on with the ransom if the deal falls you'll also be left stranded here, Bear's words irritated Wolfram, still he had no choice but to accept the insectoid's demands. The organization that employed them was supposed to take care of their extraction out of the country. If things soured to that extent, they'd be forced to pay extra in alternative smuggling methods. Fine. I got the point. Now leave us alone. And you better have not done anything to any of my men, Wolfram's threat seemed to completely fly over Bear's head. Not in a way that he didn't understand it, just that he really didn't care about it. Still, he didn't need to lie about things to further sour relationships between them. Don't worry he's fine just knocked out I'll take him to your hide spot after this is over, Wolfram stared into Bear's eyes. Then just grunted and continued with the heist. He quickly commanded everyone to prepare for departure. The problem here was that the heroes had already shown up Mirko, the rabbit hero, was never a person to get interested in high school events. So, she was out patrolling while this heist was starting. And it didn't take long for her to be called in, as the police contacted all of the heroes patrolling around Tokyo to assist them. So, she was now starting at the bank that was currently filled with villains and hostages. She needed to wait for an opportunity to rush in and take them all out. She had confidence in herself, but she didn't know exactly how many of them there were. She also didn't know the exact number of hostages. So she was stuck waiting like that. Something that irritated her to no end. But her chance would come soon. As Wolfram and his group finally got done filling their bags with the loot, and prepared to call in their getaway vehicles. POV Bear. After my little argument with Wolfram, things went smoothly. I do get weird gazes all the time now, I don't think his mercenary group really appreciated me doing that. But I wasn't left with much of a choice. I need to make sure they don't step out of line, and there was no subtle way to tell them that it wouldn't be a great idea to ransom people. I kinda had to put it into words. Maybe I could've been a bit kinder about things. Nah, who cares. Are you guys done yet? I asked towards Wolfram who just stared at me with a bit of hate. 
Yes, we're calling in the escape vehicles. What will you be doing? That's a fair question I guess I need to do my job too. I'll take care that the heroes don't interrupt you. I can do at least that much I can already see quite a few of them gathered outside. I wonder what quirks I should use. I certainly can't let them realize I have more than one. We can take care of them on our own. Does this guy really feel like showing off in this situation? They'll get their shit kicked in less than a minute. There are quite a lot of heroes outside, and not many of them are afraid of bullets. Sure, they may have some offensive quirks, they certainly don't have anywhere near enough to deal with both the police and the heroes. You're welcome to try but you won't get too far, my common just made him grumble about a bit. He gave the signal for all of his men to grab a hostage and start heading outside. You can guess that the civilians and bank employees aren't quite happy about that. They seem to be scared and panicking. But they aren't actually going to get hurt. This is just a common practice to avoid getting shot by the police on their way out. I also followed along. Some people were still left inside the bank, but I don't really care about that anymore. I stared at Wolfram, as he faced the heroes and police with a smile on his face. Let's see how he wants to handle this he just walked over to a traffic light pole, everyone was still slowly walking right beside him. He touched the traffic light pole, and it seemed to sink itself into the concrete a bit, bending around in different ways. Suddenly, the concrete street trembled around the police as they all panicked and tried to look for cover. Out of the ground sprouted different types of metal constructs, wires dancing around and locking people into place, pullers raising squad cars and throwing them into adjacent buildings. The heroes were forced to act, a lot of them quickly storming in and trying their best to separate the civilians from the villains. Remember no civilian casualty I appeared beside Wolfram and spoke out as he was starting around at the heroes fighting his men. That's a bit impractical that was all he managed to mutter. I just released an exasperated sigh, cars quickly rolled down the road, bands of all shapes and sizes. I quickly ran around and pulled civilians out of the villain's hands and threw them towards the heroes. I also had to stop any villain from being captured. I ended up punching and kicking quite a few of them. Wolfram and his boys quickly got on their cars, but all was not so well, as the more powerful heroes also started making their move, now that civilians were out of the picture. The police could also open fire. A tad lady with white hair and bunny ears quickly jumped into the fray, kicking one of the vans into the air, forcing me to jump towards it and catch it. I quickly gave it a push in the right direction, by the time I turned around there was already an axe kick coming towards my head. The rabbit lady had spun around in the air a few times, the momentum she managed to build was quite something. I managed to raise my hand and block it, the shock wave seemed to push some of the other heroes away, giving the van some time to create distance between them and the police. They had already managed to break through the encirclement, they now just need to get rid of the pursuit. The rabbit lady was just staring at me with a bit of surprise in her eyes. She was still suspended in midair, as she tried to bring her leg down. In the end, she gave up. She quickly jumped away from me and stared me down. Then a large smile appeared on her face. This one's mine. She shouted to the other heroes. I fucking knew this job would be needlessly complicated POV narration Wolfram, and his group acted quickly and started departing from the scene. He quickly noticed the identity of the person following them, it was one of the quickly rising heroes, Mirko, the rabbit hero. He knew that she was strong, and seeing the damage her kick did to one of their vans just confirmed it. But he didn't expect Baru to just go off and start directly blocking her kick. He had assumed Baru had some sort of infiltrating quirk. After all, he had taken the appearance of one of his men. But, it seemed like he had been wrong. Baru's quirk had a lot to do with strength. That realization made him sweat a bit, but he could only grit his teeth in annoyance. Maybe he wouldn't have been that easy to fight he had just calmed himself earlier with the fact that this infiltrator was not strong enough to take all of them on. But now he didn't have that assurance. Which made him quite worried about the intentions of his employer. Still, he was locked to the contract now. He couldn't back out easily. And, while well, he was contemplating what he had gotten himself into. Mirko was contemplating how to approach her opponent. Bear had repeatedly disregarded her and dashed towards after heroes, she found that insulting, but she also couldn't stop him easily. He was always near other people, and she needed to hold back accordingly. All until she finally realized that the robbers were slowly getting away. She suddenly got angry and looked at Bear with a serious gaze. She used her greatest speed to rush towards Bear, dashing from building to building and appearing right above him prepared to kick him into the ground. A moment of carelessness was all she needed. And she got it. Her head connected, it sent Bear flying into the street at breakneck speeds. He hit the ground and caused a shockwave strong enough to push some of the cars around him away. Don't think you can ignore me. She said angrily. But she still hoped that the fight was over. She quickly started trying to catch up to the cars. She didn't expect a large hand to just instantly appear above her. She was forced to dodge to the side. Still, a part of a hand hit her and sent her flying into a building. Bear used his Yontification Court to enlarge only his hand to stop the rabbit hero. He could easily tell that she was going to be the most troublesome hero in this situation. He had been a bit injured by her previous kick, but it was already completely healed. His transformation was also still active. And, since he wasn't actually wearing clothes he didn't need to worry about breaking them by becoming a giant. Bear transformed into someone wearing clothes, but he isn't actually wearing clothes, POV Bear. Damn, this lady hits hard. I quickly made my hand return to normal as I pulled it back. I've barely used this gigantification quirk, but it's pretty cool. 
Now I need to play up having a gigantification quirk, though and, I gotta say this. Damn girl, I was never the type to get a muscle fetish, but those thighs are still something to think about. Shit, did I say that out loud? The rabbit girl walked out of the building with an angry gaze. So you're also a pervert, huh? Guess I'll have to beat those thoughts out of your mind. She's almost fucking growling at me. You can't blame me you're dressed in what is basically a swimming suit hey, might as well dig a deeper hole since I've already started. She gritted her teeth and jumped towards me again. Her speed seems to be quite a bit better than before. Or maybe she's just more ferocious. I guess anger does that to some people. I punched in her direction, using gigantification on my hand, and making it large enough to cover almost the entire street. Now, controlling a hand this large with a small body is quite difficult, and I think this rabbit lady is aware of that. She was also expecting something like this to happen, apparently because she hopped in the air, just as my punch was about to reach her. The massive punch crashed into the building she came out of and brought her down almost instantly. The good thing about this situation is that this part of the city has been evacuated in advance, but I still need to be mindful not to actually kill any heroes in my wake. Talking about heroes, the bunny gal ran along my arm and jumped again as I attracted it back to its original state. But this gal was already on me. She spun around in the air and came down with a powerful hit. I can't really use my gigantification core properly in this instance. At least not without taking a hit. So, I quickly used gigantification on my whole body, putting an arm above my head, and rising to at least 22 meters. The hero's kick hit my arm as it was becoming bigger, and she was repelled backwards by my growing body. She glared at me with anger. I was currently in between buildings and I'm doing my best not to ruin everything around me. I doubt Oyama would appreciate that. I mean, a building is already a lot of collateral damage weight. Would the state get a discount from the construction companies if there are more buildings destroyed? Wouldn't I actually be helping them in that case? Okay, enough stupid thoughts. I don't want to break too much stuff. So I am forced to become smaller again. The good news is that Wolfram and his boys will soon be far enough for me to start escaping too. The police cars are all made of metal, after all, Wolfram seems to be able to stop them somehow. I think he just connects a small strand of steel to them and controls the metal to make the car come to a stop. Probably bricking the engines or something, I think he needs to be in constant contact with the metal, if he wants to manipulate it. Makes sense from his earlier displays, which pretty much expected, since absolute control over metal under any circumstance, would literally make him a god. At least in any city iron working facility, well, enough about that. The rabbit hero stared at me with a serious gaze, she seems really frustrated. Do you think you'll be able to escape so easily? Is she trying to psyche me out? I'm not even that engaged in this site. Your little friends won't be returning for you. They're currently occupied with tucking their tails between their legs and running away. She's actually taunting me. I probably would have felt abandoned or something if I actually was part of Wolfram's GROUP and if I actually cared, but that's not really the case, now is it? Little friends ha 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 You making fun of my large potter? I said as large in my torso, making my stomach look naturally large. Even with her serious and angry look, she still cracked a smile. She quickly covered it with a grimace. So you're buffing too ha? Huh? Nothing wrong with having a bit of fun in a serious situation at least I made sure there weren't any casualties, I said while waving my hand around a bit. You made sure. What, are you their leader or something? She stared at me with some curiosity. I guess she realized that she wouldn't be catching up with the others, so she stopped trying to hurry things along. Actually, I think she's stalling me until reinforcements come along. The other heroes had gone ahead with the squad cars, but none of them seemed to have any agility-based quirks, so they're bound to have been left behind. I'm close to being a leader I guess we're just robbers, keeping things professional is important at least, for now, this will soon be called a series of terrorist attacks by the news. By soon I mean a month or two, now, why am I telling her all this? Well, for one, she's hot and I feel like joking around with her. Voting might not be appreciated, and, the other reason is a bit more sensible. I need to give some information to the hero's authorities. They need a reason for the lack of civilian casualties. A group of violent villains not killing a single person after numerous appearances is extremely unusual. I don't need them to start questioning the validity of these attacks. That would be quite troublesome for both Oyama and me. If they realized that these attacks weren't monetarily motivated, then things would be a bit annoying. Especially if they decided to publicize that piece of information. That is, in all fairness, unlikely, but I don't like that game of chance. If that were to happen, drawing out Lady Nagin would become more of a pipe dream than it already is. This whole plan is already a fucking stretch, so you're saying you're the guy keeping things in check. Her tone was quite S-U-R-P-R-I-S-C-D maybe because I just took down a building with my fist. Somewhat I also get a bigger cut for my efforts of holding the strongest hero present occupied. I think she took that comment as a compliment. But she wasn't really flattered by it. She's a hero, after all, getting distracted like that is quite unacceptable. I see but what if there were civilians in that building? Wouldn't that have meant that you failed? She asked with an irritated gaze. I've analyzed how Japan's villain attack evacuation protocols work. I wouldn't have made that move if I didn't well. I already started with this charade, might as well keep it up. I could feel a lot of people approaching us. I know they are all heroes. They probably came back after they lost sight of Wolfram's group. Well how exactly do you plan on getting away? Or is getting caught part of your job? 
The rabbit ass with a smirk as a few heroes came into view from the road behind her. Not exactly but I do have a few ways, since I have a quirk that they know nothing about, I can always exert feats of great strength, and they won't have any idea that it's not from the same quirk. After all, maybe his gigantification quirk makes him always have the strength of a giant. Is always a good argument. I also kinda liked her style of jumping around like that. It was pretty interesting to track and block. I think I'll try that one too. Well speaking to you has been a pleasure, but if I don't fuck off these guys might split the loot without me, I made a peace sign and bend my legs. My actions immediately made Rabbit Lady react. She dashed towards me, but she wasn't fast enough to stop me. I jumped with a lot of force, breaking the asphalt beneath me. I then proceeded to jump from building to building with much of the same strength. The speed I decided to use is similar to hers, but I have a head start. And, after a few turns, I warped away and lost her. I warped back onto the building where I had left the bloke I transformed into. I warped him back to the warehouse, transformed back into myself, and returned to the stadium. Well, that wasted an hour of my life. Now I have to look at recordings to see how far Toga made it in the last event. Which should still be ongoing. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.